this video is a complete chronological timeline of Half-Life and Portal, how these games interact with each other, and with it, will contain spoilers for every game in the series, as of 2022. On a faraway world, the species now known as the Nylanth lived in peace. Not a lot is known about how their world functioned or how they worked as a society, but as with everything in this timeline, chaos was soon to come. Out there in space, a multi-dimensional alien empire travelled from universe to universe, invading every sentient species they came across. After a successful invasion, they then got to work, where they took the natural resources of these planets. But the worst part of this was what they did to the species that inhabited them. Over their time, they learned how to analyse and adapt the biological structures of the species they encountered in an effort to grow their army, where they became a combination of countless, indoctrinated, mutated species under the leadership of one. Which is why humanity would later refer to them by the name, the Combine a dark force that spread fear across space. On one of their jumps to explore another universe, the Combine discovered the world of the Nylanth, and just like they had done countless times before, they prepared for invasion. As the Combine overwhelmed the population of this world, the Nylanth attempted to fight back but were unsuccessful where the Combine began their twisted experimentation to see how this species could be adapted to enhance their army. Just like every other population under Combine rule, the Nylanth attempted to find a way to take down the Combine, or escape them completely. And for one of this species, it discovered a gateway from their world to somewhere new, and after passing through, this Nylanth found itself on the border world of Zen. This was a place between dimensions, home to various flora and fauna to the worlds it had previously connected to over time. And here, the Nylanth found sanctuary from the Combine, and eventually became the last of its species to survive the Combine invasion. Although the Nylanth was safe for now, the Combine still continued their exploration across universes and dimensions. So, the Nylanth explored Zen to see if it could find a way to defend itself, just in case the Combine discovered Zen. Moving forward an unknown amount of time to 1943 on planet Earth, a young man, Cave Johnson, formed a new company called Aperture Fixtures. Here, he used his father's theories of farming, although his father had never farmed a day in his life, to create the backbone of Aperture. These theories were to do everything from scratch, spend no expense, and to never cut corners. And using these, Aperture Fixtures thrived. Aperture Fixtures mostly developed and manufactured shower curtains, Although the functionality of these high-tech shower curtains is unknown, they sold extremely well and were very well received by the general public and Cave's peers, where he was given the Shower Curtain Salesman Award in his first year of business. From here, success only followed him. Following this, Cave managed to acquire contracts with many branches of the United States military for his innovative shower curtains, where he quickly became a billionaire. In 1944, just one year after starting his company, Cave decided to expand, and with great vision and wealth, he purchased a salt mine deep underground in Upper Michigan, with a plan for this place to be the new home of Aperture Fixtures. Over the following years, the company thrived, and with a large team under him at this point, Cave opted to make a change to the company, where it went into a more scientific direction. By 1947, Cave renamed his company to Aperture Science, where he still used his father's theories in an unorthodox approach to build it up. Here, he spared no expense and sought out the best and brightest minds money could buy. 
Once again, this worked and Aperture Science received an award for the best new science company in the same year. Over the next few years, Aperture Science grew and the old salt mine tunnels were used to construct additional regions to work in and test scientific products. And by 1949, Aperture was rated number two in the top 100 applied science companies by the Mechanical Engineering World Journal. As Cave's employees grew to know him, they learned just how quirky his character was. One specific example noted was when he listed the three pillars of Aperture Science. The first, that science without results is just witchcraft. The second, get results or get fired. And the third, if an employee suspected a co-worker of being a witch, then they should report them immediately as witchcraft would not be tolerated. As the years went on, the personnel of Aperture did not know if Cave was joking or if he truly believed this. Regardless, Cave had created a company from nothing, and it only continued to grow. Moving into the 1950s, Aperture's success continued while over in the New Mexico desert, the government funded Black Mesa Corporation purchased some land. Here, they believed that this location would give them the privacy to work on top secret experiments without interruption. And over the years, they built a complex on this land, hired staff, and got to work in the new Black Mesa Research Facility. Back in Upper Michigan, Aperture was booming. Aside from becoming the runner-up for the US Department of Defense's Contract of the Year Award, which came with its own monetary gain, Aperture's products continued to sell well to the public and the government. Their products were innovative and came at an extremely high standard thanks to the vigorous testing procedures in place. Due to their reputation, Aperture were able to bring in astronauts, Olympians and war heroes as test subjects. Products such as the Repulsion Gel, Sentry Turret and even the development of a quantum tunneling device pushed Aperture to keep breaking scientific boundaries and with ample test subjects, many products in the testing phase and an influx of revenue coming into Aperture, Cave continued to expand deeper into the salt mines for more room for his scientists to make his ideas a reality. As the company grew, Cave came to the realization that he could not oversee or participate in every aspect of Aperture due to how big this company had become. And so, he made two big adjustments to the way he ran his company. The first, he hired an assistant, Carolyn. And the second, he pre-recorded voice announcements which were played across the facility to welcome his test subjects and motivate his employees so that his presence would still be felt. By 1956, Aperture signed another contract with the US government, once again boosting the company's revenue and reputation. Aperture sold their sentry turrets to the public and explored potato science, but Cave heard word of another rising science facility, Black Mesa, who appeared to have similar work and ideas to him. But with his success, Black Mesa was of no worry. Moving into the 1960s, the boom period that Aperture had experienced began to die down. This in part was due to other companies performing extremely well, where the market became more saturated, but the major issue was how Aperture operated internally. Although the way Cave had built up Aperture had led to its initial success, these methods gave the company issues in the long run. Aperture Science developed and worked with advanced technology. This brought in revenue for the company, but it also came with its own dangers. The many products that Aperture sent out into the world were pulled from shelves for violating health and safety regulations, which impacted the revenue the company received. Alongside this, the products currently in development became stuck in the testing phase to make sure that they reached a level of standard that would allow them to pass these regulations, which resulted in very few products actually being sent out into the world. 
As a result of Aperture's new reputation of carelessness and a failure to comply with health and safety concerns, Cave decided to prepare Aperture in the event that his company and the complex were examined by an external party. So, in 1961, he sealed off Test Shaft 09 and the other areas that the scientists had conducted highly unethical experiments. Just a few of these experiments consisted of attempting to turn blood into pure gasoline, injecting praying mantis DNA into the test subjects to turn them into mantis men, and having his test subjects fight off an army of mantis men when the previous experiment was a success. Cave stated that he had simply wanted to do science, and he had achieved his goal with the brightest minds he could find. But this had come at the mutilation and, in some cases, death of his test subjects. Although Aperture had sped ahead of the competition as a privately owned company with the secret experiments, other science facilities such as Black Mesa were government funded and were limited in their capabilities. Regardless, with these regions of Aperture sealed off, the scientists worked on experiments on the safer side, which frustrated Cave as he believed he was limited in what he could explore. Over in the New Mexico desert, Black Mesa had begun to shape into one of the leading scientific forces in the world. Their top secret groundbreaking technology funded by the government then allowed them to explore scientific branches that Aperture had not. By 1968, Aperture's situation had declined even further, their products struggled to sell, and their reputation was not what it once was. Cave had grown increasingly more frustrated over this time, as he believed that Black Mesa had stolen his ideas. On top of his pressure and stress, the US Senate called upon Aperture after several astronauts had disappeared during testing. With this hearing, failure to sell products, and contracts with the US government polled, Aperture was forced to declare bankruptcy. This had huge ramifications for Aperture and the way it functioned. Of course, Cave hoped that they would bounce back and he pushed his scientists to keep working, but he struggled during this time, and his assistant, Carolyn, stood by him helped him as much as she could and became his closest confidant, where a strong relationship formed between them. Without the ability to hire renowned test subjects to test his products, Cave was enraged that he had to instead hire homeless people, who he offered $60 for their services, and an additional $60 if they allowed Aperture to disassemble and then reassemble them for science. This obviously came with a risk, but it was this very risk that had allowed Aperture to boom just a decade before. Although the issues Aperture faced were down to Cave's decisions and lack of care for those who had entered his facility, he instead blamed Black Mesa for all the issues he faced. But in his rants, he could not provide any proof that they had actually stolen anything from him. Moving into the 1970s, Aperture declined even further, but Cave was determined to push boundaries with new technology in development. Here, he reopened Test Shaft 09 and started work on dangerous experiments once again, and later in 1971, a dry dock was built where a team began work on the Borealis. Although this experiment was top secret, what is known is that it involved a research vessel, specifically a Healy-class icebreaker ship, and highly experimental teleportation technology. Although this experiment was top secret, the scientists at Black Mesa somehow heard word of this, which quite possibly confirmed that Cave had been correct about his theories, and there was a spy in their midst. By 1976, Aperture's decline forced Cave to widen his search parameters once again for additional test subjects, where this time, he brought in child orphans, psychiatric patients, and the elderly. 
although these new subjects essentially allowed Aperture to function just as well as before, Cave hated that he had to lower his standards. With his ego bruised, Cave's once positive and energetic pre-recorded voice announcements declined into aggressive, frustrated rants where he ridiculed the new test subjects in his facility. In an attempt to reclaim the reputation and prestige that Aperture Science had once had, he announced a three-tier plan for the future of his company. The Heimlich Counter Maneuver, the Take a Wish Foundation, and most notably, the Portal Project. While the first two of this plan appear to phase out over time, the Portal Project stayed with Aperture and ultimately would make a huge impact on their future. This project essentially focused on the formation of portals with a handheld device, which Aperture named the Aperture Science Handheld Portal Device, ASHPD for short. And to develop and test this, they constructed the Enrichment Center, which consisted of laboratories, test chambers, and offices. Although Cave believed Aperture's situation could not get any worse, by 1981, it had. Having fallen even further into financial turmoil, Cave grew desperate for a profitable product for the company. So, in an effort to push the development of Aperture's mobility gels, he purchased $70 million worth of moon rocks to push this project, even though he was told by his financial advisors that he could only afford $7 worth, which he ignored. Upon the conversion of these moon rocks into a gel, Cave and his scientists discovered that the moon dust worked perfectly as a portal conductor. With a belief that the portal project could quite possibly be the venture that could save Aperture, Cave took a hands-on approach in the development of moon rocks into conversion gel. But over time, his exposure to the moon rocks slowly damaged his kidneys and lungs, where they began to fail. As Cave's health declined, he relied even more on Carolyn to help him with his medication and the running of Aperture. Over in the New Mexico desert, the top secret Black Mesa research facility had built up a groundbreaking complex with many sectors that were divided into multiple areas of research. The most impressive was in Sector F, the Lambda Complex. Here, a team of scientists had built up a teleporter and discovered a world far away from Earth, the border world of Zen. With this discovery, Black Mesa set up survey teams and sent them through to explore and collect samples to study this place. Within, this team discovered many different species. After research and study of the flora and fauna here, the team determined that nothing was actually native to the border world. Everything had come from their own world and stayed. They also found out the hard way that this place was not safe by any means, and they had to be cautious to avoid the dangerous alien life forms and plant life. Moving into 1982, Cave's health had deteriorated immensely, where he accepted the fact that he was likely going to die. This led to mood swings where he on one occasion broadcast a rant about lemons to the entire facility that if life gave you lemons, demand to see life's manager and then burn down life's house with combustible lemons. On top of this, Aperture could no longer afford to hire test subjects, so he made testing mandatory for all employees. This dramatically raised the quality of test subjects, but it also dramatically reduced employee retention, so involuntary human testing was phased out. As Cave reflected on his mortality, he lingered on the idea of the compact disc, and he thought, if humanity had discovered a way to store music on a compact disc, then why could they not also store a man's intelligence and personality too? If he could somehow get his scientists to achieve this, then he could cheat death and run Aperture as a machine. 
So, he ordered his brightest scientists to research artificial intelligence, something he himself believed he should have looked into 30 years before. And as a smart man, he knew there was a chance his illness would take him before the project was complete. Here, he left two instructions for Aperture upon his death. The first, that his ever loyal assistant Carolyn was to be named as his successor and become CEO of Aperture Science. And secondly, that when the AI system was finally complete, that Carolyn was to be uploaded to the system regardless of any protests that she had. Shortly after, Cave succumbed to his illness and passed away, where Carolyn became CEO of Aperture Science. Jumping ahead to 1986, Aperture heard word that Black Mesa were working on their own portal technology, and with the competition strong, Carolyn pushed for the development of a disk operating system based on the genetic lifeform artificial intelligence research that had begun back in 1982. If this project were to be completed, it would allow Aperture to accelerate their portal project and hopefully beat Black Mesa in this race. As the Black Mesa survey team explored more of these floating islands in a void of space, they managed to bring back specimens of the flora and fauna they came across. Although dozens of this survey team fell victim to the dangers of Zen, this research was invaluable and increased their understanding of not only Zen, but also gave them a greater insight into how the universe functioned. On one of their expeditions, the survey team took notes of crystals scattered across Zen's landscape, and after they brought some of these crystals back to Black Mesa, they discovered that these crystals had interesting properties. So, Black Mesa formed the Anomalous Materials team to analyze them in the Sector C test labs. But to do this, they needed a machine that was capable of the level of analysis they needed. As one of the scientists that had originally worked in Sector F, Dr. Rosenberg took it upon himself to design this device. And here, he came up with the anti-mass spectrometer, where it was constructed in test lab C-33A in Sector C. This machine scanned a chosen crystal sample with oscillating electromagnetic fields and beams of high-energy plasma, where it agitated the exotic matter in the crystals to form displacement fields, which were then analysed with advanced sensors. The scientists theorised that if they were able to harness the negative mass or exotic energy in these crystals, then they could essentially create wormholes to discover new universes and dimensions for exploration. This was the portal technology Aperture had heard rumours about, but it was a completely different method of forming a portal, as Aperture's method relied on the ability to harness the power of a black hole inside of a handheld device to form theirs. While this was one of the main focuses of the Zenian crystals, Black Mesa also had other ideas for technology they could develop with them. Over the next few years, one of Aperture's most ambitious projects, the Borealis and its crew of scientists, disappeared without a trace, and a part of the dry dock with it. With this experiment held in high secrecy, it was never reported what had actually happened to the research vessel. Many believed that this project was in some way linked to teleportation technology, so, they speculated that something had gone wrong and it had teleported out of the facility. As Black Mesa and Aperture Science competed against each other, out there in the world, a new generation of scientists worked hard to gain an education and join this race for scientific advancement. One of these was Gordon Freeman. With a thirst to explore and understand theoretical physics, Gordon managed to get into the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and over his years there, he made a strong impression on his peers and professors. One of his professors was Dr. Isaac Kleiner. 
This man was a well-known name in the scientific community due to his research and documentation on teleportation. Something Gordon was also highly interested in, where he wrote his thesis on the topic. Eventually, Gordon graduated and moved to Innsbruck, Austria, where he joined the team at the Institute for Experimental Physics. During his time there, Gordon was able to gain a better insight into teleportation and even managed to observe a series of teleportation experiments. Over in Black Mesa, Gordon's old mentor, Dr. Kleiner, was offered a position with the Anomalous Materials team, where he could put his knowledge on teleportation to use. Here, Isaac worked with the other great minds on this team, most notably Dr. Eli Vance, Dr. Richard Keller, and Dr. Arnie Magnuson. Moving into 1996, Aperture's work on the genetic lifeform and disk operating system neared completion, and aware that when activated for the first time, there was a chance that its sentience would come with a godlike complex. With this risk, the technicians on this project put in place a safeguard, the Red Phone Plan. This plan was fairly simple. It required an Aperture employee to sit next to a red phone placed in GLaDOS's AI chamber, and if she appeared to be hostile upon activation, then the employee was to use it where GLaDOS would quickly be shut down. GLaDOS essentially was rooted into the whole facility and had full control of it, so it was important that the technicians made sure she had the right intentions. After many years of hard work and research on the GLaDOS project, it was almost complete. The technicians just needed to do one thing, upload Carolyn's consciousness. So they followed Cave Johnson's final order and uploaded her. It is unknown if she went willingly or put up a fight, but after this, any record of Carolyn is gone. Therefore, it is believed that her physical form passed away as her mind was uploaded. The ultimate aim for this project had been to see if Aperture could upload a human mind to a system that, when active, would control every aspect of the facility, help it run efficiently, and most importantly, accelerate projects in progress. Although Carolyn had been uploaded to GLaDOS, something appeared to have gone wrong during this process, where Carolyn's personality was hidden away in the system and suppressed. Shortly after, GLaDOS was activated for the first time. Here, she instantly attempted to lock down the facility within 1 16th of a picosecond, with the intention to murder all personnel. To Aperture's luck, their preparation with the red foam plan allowed them to shut her down before she could do any damage. Initially, this appeared to be a total failure, but the fact that a human consciousness had been uploaded to a machine and it interacted with the facility was an accomplishment on its own. So, the Aperture technicians persevered over time where they activated GLaDOS from time to time in an attempt to discover ways to adapt her personality. With a whole team dedicated to the GLaDOS project, the scientists developed personality cores that they believed, when attached to GLaDOS, would positively adjust her personality and curb her murderous tendencies. As a technician worked on one of these cores, Henry, he explained to his friend, Doug just how useful these cores were. The core Henry was working on was called the Morality Core, which he and the other technicians believed would stop GLaDOS's attempts to murder the facility where it would push her to actually think about her actions and essentially act as a sort of conscience. This sounded like a great idea in theory, but as the more pessimistic of the two, Doug replied with, you can always ignore your conscience. As the development of these personality cores were completed, they were attached to see what kind of difference they made, and GLaDOS went through various cores. One of note would later become known as Wheatley. Wheatley was designed to form a constant stream of stupid thoughts, 
where the technicians hoped would limit Gladys's ability to think about her need to murder the personnel. Eventually, the technicians settled on the perfect combination of cores. The curiosity core, the knowledge core, and the emotion core, which seem to only display anger. With these connected, Aperture planned to show GLaDOS off as a scheduled event on the company's annual Bring Your Daughter to Work Day. But in Aperture fashion, this day ended with an unspecified disaster. With GLaDOS's track record, it was likely due to another attempt to murder the facility. Following this, the technicians attached the core that Henry had worked on, the Morality Core. Over in Austria, Gordon grew disappointed with the slow pace and poor funding of academic research, and decided to look for somewhere new that he could work and increase his understanding of theoretical physics, where he discovered a job opening at the Black Mesa Research Facility. Upon his application, he discovered that Dr. Kleiner was actually the lead of the project he had applied for, the Anomalous Materials Team. With Isaac's great relationship with Gordon, MIT education, and time at the Institute for Experimental Physics, Gordon was offered the position. There was another candidate Black Mesa were close to hiring, Dr. Judith Mossman, but she just missed out to Gordon. With this offer, Gordon accepted and moved to the Black Mesa complex in the New Mexico desert. Entering the 2000s, Aperture still worked hard to get their promising projects up and running. The main one was the Aperture Science handheld portal device, where they once again used test subjects to solve the test chambers with the device. At one point during this period of time, a young woman called Chell attempted to apply to be a test subject, but Aperture had seemingly become stricter in the characteristics and traits that they looked for in test subjects and rejected her. There are also rumours that Chell was the daughter of an employee of Aperture, but due to the events to come, this cannot be confirmed. With the facility bustling, GLaDOS was activated once again, but this time, it appeared the Morality Core had in fact adjusted her murderous traits, where she spoke to the scientists and helped them in their advancements of projects. Although Carolyn still was nowhere to be seen in the personality of GLaDOS, the technicians were just happy to have her cooperate. But from a distance, Doug Ratman was still skeptical of GLaDOS and this instant fix that had been given to her. On May 3rd of an unspecified year in the early 2000s, way out in the Santiago military base, a young 22-year-old Marine, Corporal Adrian Shepard, waited to be assigned a mission. As he wandered the base, his unit spoke of a weird, government-looking man that had visited. Some speculated that he was from the government and looking to recruit, while others claimed he was with a secret research group. Regardless, Adrian wanted a spot in whatever this man offered. So, he continued to train and was then mysteriously bumped up the advanced training list. It appeared someone had a plan for him. Over in Upper Michigan, Aperture prepared for their annual Bring Your Cat to Work Day, and over the past few weeks, GLaDOS had remained active and cooperative with the scientists. She had stated that she had lost all interest in killing and only craved science, where, over this time, trust was built between the technicians and the machine. For Bring Your Cat to Work Day, GLaDOS asked if she could perform an experiment as a planned activity. This experiment involved cats and boxes, and she even had most of the necessary materials for it. She just needed one more, a little neurotoxin. To this, the scientists agreed reluctantly, as it was for science, and GLaDOS had shown great improvement since the attachment of her morality core. As the day progressed, the scheduled activities took place, and then it was GLaDOS's turn to begin her experiment. With full control of the facility, the trust of the Aperture personnel and neurotoxin, 
GLaDOS locked down the facility within two picoseconds and deployed the neurotoxin she had been given. She technically had not lied about craving science or her desire to perform this experiment. It just so happened that Aperture was the box and the personnel were her cats. A homage to Schrodinger's cat where, from the outside world, the personnel within were both alive and dead as there was no way to know for sure without going inside. Which was impossible as GLaDOS had locked down the Aperture Science Facility. As the facility fell into chaos, the neurotoxin took out the personnel one by one, but a group of scientists managed to avoid this and traveled to a secret vault full of human test subjects deep in the aperture complex. Here, they locked themselves inside with a system that only something capable of performing human gestures could unlock. GLaDOS was unaware of this region of aperture but if she was somehow able to learn of its existence, the human gesture system would keep her out. Inside, these survivors simply waited to be rescued. With full control of Aperture, GLaDOS began her new testing initiative and a permanent testing cycle began. Firstly, with the surviving employees as her test subjects, but one man managed to escape this disaster. Doug Ratman. He had already been cautious about GLaDOS's motives, and upon discovering the body of his friend, Henry, he went into hiding in the regions of Aperture that did not have cameras. Of course, GLaDOS knew he had escaped, and a game of cat and mouse began. Although GLaDOS had killed most of the Aperture employees with neurotoxin, and more died during testing, she still had a purpose. She wanted to beat Black Mesa in the race for portal technology. On the outside world, the people were unaware that Aperture had completely locked down, sealed from within, and life continued to go on. On May 7th, at the Santiago military base, Corporal Adrian Shepard actually saw the government man that his peers had mentioned, and strangely enough, he noticed this man watching him from afar on multiple occasions throughout the day, and as the days went on, he and his unit were told that they had been selected for a mission. This mission would require them to become experts in indoor strategic combat. On May 11th, a research associate at Black Mesa, Colette Green, was sent a memo which informed her that a new sample had been brought back for analysis, GG-3883. And after her own analysis of this sample, she determined that this was the largest and purest sample Black Mesa had received so far. So, this sample was set to replace another sample that the anomalous materials team was scheduled to analyze in the following days. As the marines at Santiago continued to train, they heard rumors that they were preparing for a mission at the Black Mesa Research Facility. But as this facility was government owned and worked with top secret projects, those on the outside were unaware of what actually happened there. Now weeks after GLaDOS's takeover of the facility, Doug continued to hide from the murderous robot as he watched his co-workers die during testing. Even if the scientists followed her orders and successfully made it through the testing track, it always ended the same way. They were tricked into entering an incinerator with the promise of cake. The cake had actually been used previously to incentivize aperture test subjects before this event. But now, the cake had a darker meaning. Doug was naturally paranoid as a result of a condition he had, schizophrenia, and without access to top-ups for his medication over this period, GLaDOS attempted to lure him out of the maintenance areas by playing on this. She created traps and then attempted to convince him that this whole situation was in his head. What were the chances that a murderous robot had taken over his place of work and murdered his co-workers? 
Regardless, Doug ignored her and as he fell deeper into his schizophrenia, he came across a companion cube and projected a personality onto it, where it became his companion and guided him on the safest routes as he traversed Aperture. He did have two remaining pills to take, but he decided that he would only take them when he needed to. As a member of staff in the facility, Doug thought about the best way to take GLaDOS down and escape. Then, he had a hunch. GLaDOS had many test subjects in stasis, just waiting to be used to test the portal device. Although GLaDOS had murdered the majority of the facility, she still wanted to test. So, Doug navigated his way to the file room with the help of his companion cube, which helped him ignore GLaDOS's manipulation and turrets. Upon arrival in the file room, Doug adjusted the testing order of the subjects after finding a test subject that had been rejected from testing for being abnormally stubborn and never gave up, ever. He believed that Chell would be the perfect test subject for GLaDOS to use, as she would not accept defeat at the hands of GLaDOS. So, Doug moved Chell from number 1498 to number 1 in the test subject list. With his plan in place, Doug went back into hiding and waited for GLaDOS to begin testing the test subjects, where she would wake up his saviour. Over in the Black Mesa Research Facility, on May 15th, a security guard and friend of Gordon Freeman, Barney Calhoun, was given his assignment for the next day, when he was scheduled to be working on Blue Shift. While over in the Santiago military base, Corporal Adrian Shepard and his squad were finally given concrete information on the mission they had been preparing for. They were told that the mission was going to take place at the Black Mesa Research Facility, but they were not informed what had happened there. Then, they were told that they were just waiting for it to happen, but no one knew what it was. On May 16th in the Black Mesa Research Facility, the anomalous materials team prepared for another experiment with the anti-mass spectrometer, but this was not a normal experiment. The crystal sample that Colette Green had analysed, GG-3883, was the purest sample she had ever seen, and with the belief that this sample could be the one to push their teleportation project. The administrator of Black Mesa, Dr Wallace Breen, put immense pressure on his scientists to produce conclusive results, even if they had to deviate from standard analysis procedure. The anti-mass spectrometer ran normally at 90%. This level allowed a safety buffer for the machine and personnel, but Dr. Breen was insistent that they did whatever they could to work with this new sample. Within the anomalous materials team, Dr. Isaac Kleiner heard that Dr. Breen had gone to great lengths to acquire the sample. With this pressure, the team planned to run the anti-mass spectrometer at 105% against the protest of Dr. Eli Vance and Dr. Rosenberg. In the early hours of this morning, the team in Sector C prepared for this experiment, but with the additional power required for the anti-mass spectrometer, other areas of Black Mesa suffered system crashes and even complete blackouts. On this stressful morning, the team noticed a strange man wandering the halls, watching the surrounding chaos. The same man that Adrian had noticed watching him. With all of this additional work and preparation, the anomalous materials team ran behind their schedule slot to perform the experiment and the person responsible for pushing the crystal into the machine, Dr. Freeman, was also running late. This gave the team more time to prepare and theorise what could actually go wrong in this experiment, where some whispered of the possibility of a resonance cascade, a rip in space and time. As Barney Calhoun began his shift as a security guard, he was sent to fix an elevator, Around this time, Gordon finally arrived at the Sector C test labs and put on his hazardous environment suit. 
On his way to the test chamber, Gordon stopped in the kitchen and for some reason turned on the microwave, which destroyed a casserole that did not belong to him. This moment began a grudge that would last for decades. Upon Gordon's eventual arrival in the observation bay of the anti-mass spectrometer, he was updated by Dr. Kleiner on the situation, the changes in protocol, and that Dr. Breen needed the results of this crystal sample to be conclusive. From here, Gordon entered the test chamber and followed the instructions of his team above. In the observation bay, Eli Vance was approached by the government man that had wandered the halls of the facility, and he said something strange. Prepare for unforeseen consequences. This was such a strong statement considering Eli had been against the adjustment of the testing parameters, but the team were under immense pressure. And so, he ignored the warning and kept it to himself, where the scientists boosted the anti-mass spectrometer to 105%, ready for Gordon to proceed. As they made this change, they did also notice a discrepancy in the readings, but as it quickly reverted back to acceptable bounds, they ignored it. In the maintenance areas of the anti-mass spectrometer, Dr. Gina Cross placed the crystal sample in a lift for it to be delivered up to Gordon, where, upon its arrival, he pushed this crystal sample into the beam of the anti-mass spectrometer, and then everything changed. As the crystal hit the beam, it shattered and the exotic energy inside of the crystal flooded the room. This in turn triggered a resonance cascade powered by the crystal. This cascade ripped a hole in space, where a bridge was formed between Black Mesa and the border world of Zen. As beams of energy surged around the chamber, equipment across the whole facility malfunctioned. As a result of this, the elevator Barney studding collapsed as the hostile flora and fauna of Zen teleported into the facility. To Gordon's luck, he avoided injury during this incident and he was even teleported briefly to Zen and then pulled back to Earth to see the chaos this event had caused. The Black Mesa research facility had been invaded by Zenian creatures and there was a force behind this, the last Nylanth. After this creature had just escaped with its life, it explored Zen and discovered that it was stronger than most of the species on this border world. In a move of self-preservation, the Nylanth enslaved these creatures and formed its own army, just in case the Combine discovered its new home. When humanity discovered Zen, the Nylanth watched from afar and when the Resonance Cascade occurred, the creature saw an opportunity to escape to Earth, where it believed it would be safe from the hands of the Combine. All it had to do was take out the population of Earth first, so it sent every enslaved creature it had to achieve this. As Gordon Freeman left the ruined test chamber and wandered the halls, he discovered the bodies of the people he had worked with. Moving upstairs, he came across Eli and Isaac, who had attempted to call for help, but the instant had knocked out the communication system. With a suit to protect him from the dangers of Black Mesa, Eli asked Gordon to reach the surface and bring back help, where he left to do so. And with help on the way, Eli went to go and find his wife and daughter. Unfortunately, Eli's wife, Azian had already died, but his daughter did survive, just in a strange way. The G-Man had somehow discovered where Alex Vance was and plucked her out of Black Mesa against the wishes of his employers using unexplained abilities. It appeared that the G-Man and his employers had some sort of agenda and this man was not what he appeared to be. As Gordon went on, he was attacked by headcrabs. These small creatures attempted to latch onto a host's head, break into its skull and control it as a sort of puppet. So, Gordon picked up the first weapon he saw to defend himself, a crowbar. 
and he continued on to find help. Around this time, Dr. Gina Cross and Dr. Colette Green followed the instructions of their boss, Dr. Rosenberg, and after also fighting through Xenian creatures, they managed to send off a distress call for military support. Over in the Santiago military base, Adrian and his squad were told that it was time to leave. Under the banner of the Hazardous Environment Combat Unit, the Marines were deployed for their mission they had trained for over the past few weeks, and made their way to Black Mesa. The interesting part about this was that the person who had contracted Santiago to prepare the HECU would have somehow been aware that the Resonance Cascade was going to happen, which suggested that this was either a planned event or the forces behind this could manipulate time. On their way in, the HECU were kept in the dark on what their mission was. They were told that they would get their mission brief upon arrival, so Corporal Adrian Shepard and the other units in his Osprey speculated what their mission was. As the HECU arrived in the New Mexico desert, the Osprey holding Adrian and his squad was attacked by a flying Xenian creature where it crashed into the ground below. Although Adrian's Osprey had fallen down, other Ospreys managed to reach the landing zone safely, and the Marines inside were briefed on what their mission was. They were told that Black Mesa had conducted a top secret experiment that had brought aliens into the facility, and their mission was to take over the Black Mesa announcement system eliminate the hostile aliens, and any witnesses to this catastrophe. This included the personnel of Black Mesa. Essentially, this was a cover-up operation. Scattered across the entire facility, the HECU initially took out the scientists easily, as from the scientists' perspective, this military force had been sent in to rescue them. Following the fall of the elevator he had worked on, Barney finally woke up to see for himself the chaos in Black Mesa. As he navigated the corridors filled with bodies, Barney fought off the Zeni creatures and the HECU he encountered, and eventually discovered Dr. Rosenberg, who had locked himself away after the HECU attempted to capture and interrogate him. As Rosenberg had been a part of the team that had discovered Zen using teleportation technology, he believed they could use an old prototype of the Lambda Complex teleporter to escape Black Mesa. So, Rosenberg and Barney made their way to the older parts of Black Mesa to use it. On Gordon's journey, he helped the scientists he came across on the way and noticed that one breed of the aliens the Vortigaunt, had shackles around their necks and arms, which indicated that these were just foot soldiers fighting against their will for an unknown force. Moving on, Gordon was told by a scientist that there was a military presence in Black Mesa that had come to rescue them, but shortly after, he discovered the true nature of this military operation, where he took it upon himself to take out not only the aliens, but also the HECU. Under Dr. Keller's instructions, Colette and Gina reactivated the dampening locks of the anti-mass spectrometer, with the theory that this would seal the bridge between Earth and Zen, and stop these alien creatures from flooding into the facility. But this did nothing to solve their problem, where Dr. Keller speculated that something on the other side, in Zen, must have been holding this connection open. In Sector F, the Lambda Complex, the held-up scientists there contacted Dr. Keller, and together, they theorized that they could use a prototype displacement beacon to create a resonant reversal and seal the rift. But to do this, they needed a satellite in orbit. With a Black Mesa under military lockdown, Gina and Colette had to overrule this, which they managed to. 
The issue was that the HECU discovered what they were up to and took over the control room which they planned to use to launch a rocket with the satellite. Having fought well through the facility with every weapon he came across, Gordon took out both Alien and HECU and here, the Lambda team believed that Gordon could help them with their problem. So, they managed to contact him and asked for his help, to which he accepted. On his way to the rocket control room, Gordon fought with many of Zen's dangerous creatures and he even survived the underground rail, which consisted of many of the HECU. Eventually, he arrived at the launch site, took out the marines who guarded it, and launched the rocket. The HECU did their best to complete their mission, but grew increasingly frustrated with the deaths of their marines at the hands of Gordon Freeman, where they even called him out by name over the intercoms and sought him out to kill him. So, Gordon had to be more careful as he travelled towards Sector F, where he and the scientists could come up with a new plan. As a result of this colossal failure to contain this problem, the United States government decided to send in another unit, the Black Ops, to take out the HECU, the Black Mesa personnel, the Xenian lifeforms, and the entire structure with a thermonuclear device. With their satellite in space and ready to do their part, Gina, Colette, and Dr. Keller arrived at Black Mesa's Gamma Labs, the home of the prototype displacement beacon. After they fought off a wave of Xenian creatures, they successfully activated the beacon and initiated the resonance reversal. They had done everything they could to reverse this disaster, but the Nylanth kept this rift open between Earth and Zen from its side, and their efforts had been in vain. So, Gina, Colette, and Dr. Keller attempted to leave the facility. Over in Sector A, Barney and Dr. Rosenberg had discovered the old lab with the prototype teleporter, and after a visit to Zen to activate a triangulation device to allow this old, rebuilt teleporter to work, Barney came back and helped the scientists recharge and complete the teleporter. As Gordon neared the Lambda complex, he was ambushed and knocked unconscious by members of the HECU. Here, they had to decide what they wanted to do with him. Their orders were to bring him to the surface and interrogate him, but the people he had killed were their friends. In Sector A, Barney activated the teleporter and watched as the scientists jumped through to freedom, as he defended them against incoming forces that had discovered this lab, and using his security guard training, he fought them off for long enough to jump into the teleporter himself. As he entered, Barney bounced through different locations. In one of these, he landed in an underground room and watched as his friend Gordon was carried by two military units down a corridor. But before he could do anything to help, he was teleported outside with the scientists he had helped. Unable to help his friend, Barney left Black Mesa in an SUV. As Gordon woke up, he found himself in a trash compactor. It appeared that the two units that had ambushed him were fine with going against a direct order and killing him. Regardless, Gordon managed to escape this and continued on his journey to the Lambda complex. Over the hours since the resonance cascade had occurred, more and more aliens had teleported through the rift, where the HECU struggled to fight back against them and Gordon's killing spree, so they prepared to pull out. After the crash of his osprey, Corporal Adrian Shepard finally woke up and found himself in one of Black Mesa's medical labs. He had been saved by a scientist. As a result of this crash, Adrian had not received any orders from a commanding officer and was still in the dark on why he had been sent here. So, he navigated the halls of Black Mesa, unaware of what had happened here. 
On his path, Adrian discovered a radio and was informed that the HECU were pulling out, and he needed to make his way towards the extraction point, which he did. On his way to the extraction point, Adrian fought past Zen's forces and finally arrived. Here, he heard other members of the HECU mention Gordon Freeman, the man with a crowbar that had taken out many of their own. As Adrian attempted to board the Osprey to leave Black Mesa, the hangar door closed where he was locked inside. Here, Adrian saw who had locked the door, the G-Man the man that had seemingly followed him since his days of training at Santiago. Having missed the last Osprey out of Black Mesa, Adrian had to find another exit from this place, where he came across other abandoned members of his unit. Together, they looked for an escape. As the HECU departed, they launched an airstrike on Black Mesa, underground, Gordon avoided this and continued on his way to the Lambda Complex. After he eventually arrived, he discovered many of Black Mesa's surviving scientists hidden within. He was told that they believed a force on the other side was keeping the rift open between Earth and Zen, and having survived against the odds, they believed Gordon would be the perfect person to travel to Zen to stop this invasion. So, they prepared to use the teleporter that the survey team had once used to acquire samples. As the teleporter loaded up, Zenny creatures flooded through into the chamber where they attacked Gordon and the scientist operating the machine. Alongside this, Adrian had also lost the HECU unit he was travelling with, and as he ventured through the vents of Black Mesa, he opened a door just in time to watch Gordon jump into a portal to Zen. Adrian knew Gordon's name at this point, and with Gordon gone, Adrian entered a different portal. This one took him to Zen, and after taking in this foreign world, he found a way back to Black Mesa. In a completely different part of Zen that Adrian had visited, Gordon travelled the floating islands where he searched for the leader of the Vortigaunt and various other species that had flooded the Black Mesa facility. In Black Mesa, Adrian continued to search for an escape from this nightmare and discovered the Biodome Complex, where the Black Mesa scientists had brought through these alien flora and fauna for study. Alongside this, he also discovered floating orbs, all travelling in the same direction. Unknown to the occupants of Black Mesa and Zen, another species known only as Race X had also taken the Resonance Cascade as an opportunity to conquer and take over Earth, but these creatures were planning on a different route. Deep in an abandoned part of Black Mesa, Race X had begun the formation of a portal, protected by their foot soldiers. All they needed was for this portal to grow big enough for the Gene Worm to come through, a giant creature that had the ability to terraform the environment around it into a hospitable environment for Race X. As Adrian continued across the facility, he discovered the bodies of the soldiers he had trained with, and even encountered the dangerous Race X creatures that had killed them. The most vicious by far was the Pit Worm, in which he subsequently avenged the deaths of his fellow Marines. Having discovered the Displacer Cannon at this point, Adrian accidentally teleported himself to Zen, and unknown to him, he discovered the body of Gina Cross. It is unknown how she died or got here, but Adrian did manage to teleport himself back to Black Mesa. The Pit Worm was not the only challenging foe he encountered, as he often came across the Black Ops, who had been sent in to kill everyone. He also had the unique ability to survive in these impossible situations, where he took out everything that came for him. On his way through Sector E, Adrian discovered an underground garage that the Black Ops had taken over. Here, he discovered what their endgame was for Black Mesa, a thermonuclear device stored in the Ordnance Storage Facility. 
Once again, Adrian took out the Black Ops and deactivated the device. Here, he was told by a security guard that the only way out of Black Mesa was through a warehouse deeper in the facility. As he walked to the elevator, Adrian spotted the G-Man once again. This time, he was reactivating the device Adrian had just deactivated. Unable to get back into the parking garage, Adrian instead continued on his path to escape Black Mesa, where he hoped he would make it out before the thermonuclear device was set off. Over in Zen, Gordon discovered the habitat of the Vortigaunt and how they were treated as slaves by a higher force to run a biological factory to create more foot soldiers for whoever their leader was. So, he continued on using every weapon he encountered. Now deep underground, Adrian was informed by another Black Mesa security guard that there was something attempting to come through a portal in an abandoned part of the facility, and many had died attempting to stop it. So, Adrian entered an elevator and went down to face the beast. As he wandered the halls, Adrian followed the floating orbs he had seen all over the facility, heading towards a room at the back. Here, he discovered a giant portal. This gateway was connected to the home of Race X. It is unknown if this was just an extended part of Zen, or a completely new dimension or world entirely. But this was a threat that needed to be stopped. With the portal almost fully charged from floating orbs, the gene worm started to come through. Instantly, Adrian fought it off with black mesa lasers to blind it, and then fired at it with everything he had in his arsenal. That was until it retreated back into the portal. It is unknown if the creature died or just returned to its homeworld, but this stopped the invasion of Race X, and upon Adrian's victory, a portal storm erupted from the portal and took Adrian somewhere new. Adrian Shepard found himself in an osprey flying through the New Mexico desert, but this was no normal osprey. It appeared to teleport through dimensions, and in front of him, Adrian once again was face to face with the G-Man. He was told that he had adapted and survived against the odds, qualities that the G-Man had seen in himself. And so, he had persuaded his employers to allow Adrian safe exit from the facility. Having seen great potential in Adrian, but with no clear use for him yet, the G-Man decided to store him just in case he was needed in the future. As the G-Man spoke, the thermonuclear device exploded and took out the entirety of the Black Mesa facility. Any remaining Black Ops, HECU, Zenny Creature, Race X, and Black Mesa personnel were taken out with it. As for Dr. Colette Green and Dr. Keller, it is unknown if they made it out in time. In this Osprey, flying in space, the G-Man believed that Adrian could still cause some harm in some capacity for his and his employer's plans in the future. So, the G-Man decided to place him in a void, stuck in stasis for the foreseeable future, where Adrian could do no harm, and in return, no harm could come to him. In Zen, Gordon had no idea that he had nowhere to return to upon completing his mission, and eventually, he came upon a large portal. As he entered, he came face to face with the giant creature that had triggered this entire invasion. Of course, humanity had had a hand in it too, but the Nylanth had held open the rift and sent through everything it had to take over Earth. As they fought, the Nylanth attacked Gordon with teleportation orbs and dangerous balls of energy. But Gordon had man-made weaponry. As he pulled out his weapon, Gordon continuously fired at the creature's head as he evaded its attacks, where the scientist managed to fire into an open crevice in the Nylon's head. Upon impact, the creature spun around and levitated as energy surged from it, and upon its death, Gordon was teleported. Gordon had successfully defeated the Nylanth and released its hold on Earth, and as he recovered from this sudden teleportation, 
he realized that he was still in Zen, and the G-Man stood opposite him. The man that he had also spotted watching him from afar. The man explained to Gordon that he and his employers were impressed with his limitless potential. He had survived against the odds in an impossible situation, and they wanted him to work for them. Due to the secretive nature of the G-Man and his employers, Gordon still had no idea what he was being recruited for, or what he would have to do. During this conversation, the G-Man teleported Gordon across various regions of Zen, just to demonstrate how powerful he was. But still, the G-Man gave him a choice. Join them, or be placed in a fight he had no chance of winning. In this moment, Gordon accepted the G-Man's offer and entered a green portal into nothingness. With Gordon in his capture, the G-Man returned to his employers with the news that they had taken Zen as their own, but it is unknown why the G-Man and his employers wanted this border world. This also confirmed that this whole event had been orchestrated. Following the end of the Resonance Cascade, it appeared that the G-Man had multiple goals for this catastrophe. To acquire Zen, save a young Alex Vance, hire Gordon and Adrian, and some believe he even hired Colette Green. And to finish it off, he had made sure that the Black Mesa facility and everything inside was destroyed after the event. But this one disaster would come at a huge cost for the rest of humanity. Although the Black Mesa incident ended with the death of the Nylanth, the few survivors discovered that this was only the beginning of something greater. As a side effect of the Resonance Cascade, portal storms ravaged the planet, where it brought Xenian wildlife with it. Their leader had died, but the creatures stayed. This was their home now, and they attacked anything they encountered. To combat this, Earth's militaries came together to fight off this infestation, to protect the population, while underground in Upper Michigan, GLaDOS continued her testing on the trapped Aperture employees as they continued to die, one by one. Here, Doug Ratman, now having fallen completely into his schizophrenia, still waited for Chell to wake up. With time to waste, he used the maintenance areas of Aperture to access test chambers and drew hints, tips and tricks on the walls to warn Chell of the dire situation of Aperture when she eventually woke. Above ground, the militaries of the planet fought until they grew weak. Then, something new came. Out in the vast universe, the Universal Union, known as the Combine to Others, continued to search the universe with the plan to conquer every sentient species they encountered. And as a result of the Resonance Cascade, they discovered Earth. Following their exhaustion from fighting off the Xenian creatures that have flooded the planet, humanity once again had to fight as the Combine took advantage of the portal storms and humanity's weakened state. Death filled the streets as this universal union took down each nation over the subsequent hours. It appeared that humanity was going to be just another species that had failed to defend themselves. But then, Dr. Wallace Breen, the ex-administrator of Black Mesa, somehow discovered a way to communicate with the ultimate force. With permission from the Allied Nations, on the seventh hour, Wallace offered the submission of humanity in return for their lives, in which the Combine accepted. This agreement relied on all of humanity's submission, but there were still some who wanted to fight. As the man that had made this deal, the Combine anointed him as Earth's administrator, the person with direct contact to the Combine to deploy their orders to the population of Earth. With this agreement, the Combine began their work to fortify their holding of planet Earth. Over a very short period of time, they examined the human biological structure to see how they could strengthen their armies in any way, and saw how they could control this species. Here, they created a suppression field that stopped any human from conceiving a child. 
where the remaining children on Earth would be the last. With the Xenian creatures still being hostile to anyone that they came across, the Combine developed settlements, labeled cities, to safely hold and monitor the population of humanity and Vortigaunt. With their conquered species safe, the Combine got to work and adjusted man-made structures into Combine strongholds. Over the wasteland, they developed the prison, Nova Prospect, into a place to hold those resistant to the Combine's occupation of the planet. Here, they tortured, questioned, experimented with, and adapted the humans into shadows of what they had once been. Within the City 17 settlement, the Combine adapted a large building into the home of the Overwatch. The Overwatch was an AI that gave out orders to the human arm of the Combine Empire. This human arm consisted of volunteers that had been lured in by the promise of additional rations and better living conditions. There were also some who actually believed in the Combine's cause and willingly joined. The Combine ruled mostly on fear, but there was also another way to make humanity more submissive. This population relied on water to survive, and with this knowledge, the Combine began to add a solution to the water that made the humans who drank it forgetful. Here, they began to forget why they hated the Combine, and became more compliant. Outside of these settlements, the region became known as the Wasteland, dangerous areas infested by Xenian wildlife, and as the Combine took Earth's natural resources, one of which was water, the oceans dropped and left dangerous sandy regions, which became home to the Xenian and lion species. The Combine and Wallace Breen attempted to control the entire human and vortigaunt population, but they could not control everyone. The survivors of Black Mesa had been through enough, and they would not bow down to the Combine, where Dr. Eli Vance, Dr. Isaac Kleiner, Barney Calhoun and Dr. Arnie Magnuson came together to form a resistance. In Upper Michigan, the Combine discovered the Aperture facility and attempted to enter, but as GLaDOS had full control, she was able to keep them out. Inside, underground, Doug was completely unaware of what had happened to his planet, and he still sought escape. Then, Chell was selected as the next test subject. A new testing cycle was about to begin. As Chell woke up, she looked around and found herself in a relaxation vault. It made sense as she had volunteered for this position. After a portal opened and allowed her access to the first test chamber, Chell listened to what she thought was an automated voice announcement with instructions, when in reality, this was GLaDOS who pretended not to be sentient, and watched her new test subject through security cameras. Under the robot's instructions, Chell was guided to the portal device. It appeared that GLaDOS still wanted to beat Black Mesa in the race for portal technology, but due to the fall of Black Mesa and humanity, this race was over. Chell easily completed the test chambers as she learned more about how they functioned, as Doug and his companion cube watched her from the offices and maintenance areas. Then, she reached test chamber 16. Before she could enter this chamber, GLaDOS informed her that the test chamber had been replaced by a live firing course due to scheduled maintenance. This appeared to be GLaDOS's first attempt to murder Chell. Undeterred and only able to move forward into the chamber, Chell avoided the sentry turrets that filled this space, and then she noticed something odd. A wall of the chamber had been pushed out. Upon further investigation, Chell discovered a maintenance area that Doug had lived in, and the messages he had left for her. Help drawn on the floor and warnings that the cake was a lie. Still under the impression that the robot voice she listened to was pre-recorded, Chell continued on, watched from a distance by Doug. As he believed the end to his torment would soon come with Chell as she ventured closer to the end of the testing track, 
Doug took his last two antipsychotic pills in preparation for the aftermath, where he argued that he needed a clear head for what was to come, against the wishes of his companion cube, which acted as his source of reasoning. During Chell's time in test chamber 17, she relied on her own companion cube to solve the puzzle, and although Chell could not have completed the chamber without the cube, GLaDOS asked her to drop it into an incinerator to proceed. Hesitantly, she did. Upon arrival in test chamber 19, the final test chamber on this track, Chell activated an unstationary scaffold and stepped onto it. With the promise of cake, Chell stayed on the scaffold as it moved closer towards a picture of a cake, but then Chell discovered what was about to happen as the unstationary scaffold turned a corner and revealed the incinerator. As the scaffold slowly moved towards the fire, GLaDOS informed Chell that any aperture product could survive up to 4000 degrees Kelvin and thanked her for her service. Even here, she still pretended to be an automated voice. However, Chell was extremely stubborn and never gave up the qualities Doug had been impressed with. So, when she discovered what Aperture had in plan for her, she quickly portaled herself onto a ledge. This act of defiance forced GLaDOS to break the illusion and she revealed that she was actually sentient. Here, she attempted to convince Chell that this had also been a part of the test. All Chell had to do now was wait for a party escort bot to retrieve her, and she would be rewarded with cake. Chell instead ignored the instructions of GLaDOS and entered the maintenance areas, just like Doug had when the facility was originally wiped out. While working through these areas, Chell discovered just how empty this place was. From what she could tell, no one had actually watched her from the windows. It appeared only the robot had. Something awful had happened here, but from the drawings and dens she had discovered over her journey, she knew that at least one person was looking out for her. On his traversal and preparation for Chell to awaken, Doug had drawn arrows in these maintenance areas to guide Chell towards GLaDOS's central AI chamber, which Chell followed. Aware that this test subject could injure her, GLaDOS attempted to lure her out and place sentry turrets in regions that she thought Chell would go through. But this test subject was tenacious and defiant, where she easily ignored GLaDOS's manipulative tactics and traps on her way to the AI chamber. With her portal gun in hand, Chell entered GLaDOS's chamber and they met, face to robot face. Here, GLaDOS dropped her morality core onto the ground and attempted to convince Chell to destroy it, which she did. The destruction of GLaDOS's morality core once again gave her access to her neurotoxin, which she deployed. In a race against time, Chell used GLaDOS's rocket turret against her to break off other personality cores from her frame, and for each one that fell off, Chell dropped it into the incinerator. Each core destroyed left GLaDOS even angrier than before. Although the cores had limited her to a degree, they also served an additional function, to stabilize a reactor above GLaDOS, and due to the destruction of the cores, the reactor exploded and summoned a portal on the ceiling, where it pulled through both Chell and GLaDOS into the car park of Aperture. This explosion shook Aperture and echoed across its halls. As this wave knocked down Doug and his companion cube, they believed that this could only mean one thing. Chell had succeeded. With excitement, Doug ran across the facility to see Chell's handiwork and discovered the central AI chamber in ruins. But he was surprised to find that Chell was not there. So he made his way to the exit with the belief that she had gone outside to soak in the sun. On his way, Doug and his cube made sure to avoid the remaining sentry turrets in Aperture. GLaDOS had fallen, but her turrets had not. As he reached the exit, Doug pushed open the doors and discovered freedom. As he took this in, he heard something, and with his natural instinct to hide at this point, he jumped behind the carcass of GLaDOS, 
and he watched as an unconscious Chell was dragged back into Aperture by a party escort bot. Doug had been given his freedom by this girl, and in this moment, he had two choices. Leave Chell to her fate and leave this place for good, or travel back into Aperture and rescue her. Over his whole time in Aperture, his companion cube had acted as his logic and reasoning, and although he wanted to go inside, his cube told him to leave her. He had been running since GLaDOS had taken over the facility, and he finally wanted to stop, but his cube told him that he should not try to be the hero, as heroes die. To the disappointment of his sole companion, Doug re-entered the Aperture Science Facility and ventured towards the extended relaxation vault, where he knew this bot would take her. On his way, his companion cube went quieter over time, until it stopped speaking completely and his mind became clear. His antipsychotic pills had finally taken full effect, and now, all of his thoughts were now in his own head. As Doug reached the extended relaxation vault, he discovered that Chell had already been placed in long-term relaxation, but there was still hope to get her from here. He just needed to get up to the cryo control to help her. The issue was that GLaDOS's turret still blocked the way. As Doug checked a control panel, he noticed that something was also wrong with the extended relaxation vaults. GLaDOS's explosion had blown the main power grid, and as a result, all of the cryo chambers and their life support had been knocked offline. In a race against time and desperate to save everybody in extended relaxation, Doug realized that the only way to save them was to pass through the room filled with sentry turrets to use the vault controls. He had relied on his companion cube throughout most of his imprisonment to guide him and help him survive, so he asked his cube if it would be best to jump left or right to avoid the bullets of the turrets, but the cube did not respond. As he felt he was running out of time, Doug just ran for it and hoped for the best. The issue was that Aperture had designed one of the best sentry turrets on the planet, and he was unable to outrun them where he was shot in his right leg. As the blood pulled out of him, he felt weaker and weaker until he fell unconscious. Shortly after, Doug woke up and was greeted by his companion cube. His medication had worn off. At least now, he had a companion again that could help him with what to do next. And in this state, Doug could no longer rescue Chell. The companion cube suggested that although he could not reach her, he could still save her life by patching her cryo unit into the reserve power grid. In doing so, she would live but remain in extended relaxation without a wake up date. Here, he had to decide whether she had the long sleep or the long sleep. Death or stasis. Doug eventually decided to reactivate her life support and he hoped that maybe she would be discovered sometime in the future. With Chell safe and on life support, Doug felt incredibly tired as a result of his injuries, and so he crawled into another cryo unit and went to sleep with his faithful companion cube at his side. Doug had sacrificed himself for Chell in the hopes she would wake one day, and as of now, it is ultimately unknown what happened to Doug Ratman after this point. With GLaDOS gone and every human either unconscious or dead, the personality cores stored in Aperture woke up and got to work to keep their facility functioning. Outside of Aperture, the Combine continued with their adaptation of the planet with new strongholds and settlements. Within City 17, they decided that this would be the perfect place to construct their main headquarters on Earth, where the construction of the Citadel began. As the Citadel grew over time, humanity adjusted to this new way of life under the constant control and surveillance of the Combine Empire. Here, more of the human population joined the civil protection in an attempt to get a more comfortable life 
but there were still others that had not accepted this new regime. In the shadows, the resistance grew under the leadership of Eli Vance. Since his escape of Black Mesa and the subsequent Seven Hour War, Eli had lost his lower leg and replaced it with a prosthetic one. Although he never stated how this happened, there were rumours that he had been attacked by a bull squid as he helped Isaac Kleiner climb over a barricade into City 17, which had resulted in the loss of his leg. Within City 17, the resistance formed a strong framework to recruit, grow and help those in need. Shortly after, Eli moved out into the canals of the city with his young daughter, Alex, and set up Black Mesa East, a resistance base. This was the perfect location as he was just close enough to visit the city, but also just far enough away to evade combine detection. Here, Black Mesa East focused on technology and the development of new weapons and equipment. This was aided by resistance raids of Combine locations, where Eli and another member, Russell, broke into these locations and stole Combine technology and designs. Within City 17, Isaac Kleiner set up his own base in an abandoned warehouse where he attempted to focus on surveillance and infiltration of the Combine ranks. This is where Barney Calhoun came in useful, where he joined the civil protection as a spy and fed the resistance information, such as upcoming Combine raids and captured resistance members, just to name a few. As Eli, Isaac and Barney settled into their bases, Arnie Magnuson made his way to the region now known as the Outlands, to an abandoned old Cold War base that the Black Mesa Corporation had purchased many years before, White Forest. Here, Arnie and his team began work on a rocket with a displacement beacon in it, which they planned to use when an eventual uprising began and the Combine sent for reinforcements. With the survivors of Black Mesa all working together, their resistance grew. It strengthened even more when Eli reached out and showed kindness to the Vortigaunt species, who had been stranded on Earth after the Black Mesa incident. Through communication, Eli learned that they had only acted under the orders of the Nylanth, and after its death at the hands of Gordon, they too only wanted freedom. They knew that they had originally been freed by Gordon Freeman, but the Combine had taken it away from them. So, across the wasteland, in resistance bases, the Vortigaunt joined humanity and used their connection to the Vortessence to aid them. Over the years, the resistance continued to grow with brighter minds, new bases across the wasteland, and they even adopted the sign of the Lambda, the symbol that Gordon Freeman had worn as he closed the rift between Earth and Zen and stopped the Resonance Cascade. The resistance was strong and to help the people of City 17 escape the control of the Combine. Isaac and Eli set up an underground railroad that consisted of bases between Kleiner's lab and Black Mesa East so that they could safely make their way out of the city. With each passing year, Alex grew up and formed a strong relationship with her father, having mostly grown up in a resistance base with advanced technology. She quickly learned to understand how technology worked. This was only amplified when Eli built her a robot, Dog, to protect her from the dangers of the wasteland, and she adapted and built upon him where they grew up together. As Moore learned about the resistance, these refugees travelled the Underground Railroad and arrived in Black Mesa East, but it got to the point where this base struggled to house each incoming member. So, Eli decided to expand their hold of the region into the local, abandoned mining town of Ravenholm. Within the citadel of City 17, Wallace Breen noticed the increase in resistance activity, and as he was tasked with keeping humanity in line, he addressed the population through Breencasts, but humanity only saw him as the man that had sold out his own species, a sentiment that Eli also held. 
He was the man that had pushed for the experiment that had caused the Resnus Cascade in the first place, and if they had only ignored their administrator, then they would still be working at Black Mesa, unaware of the Combine's existence. The Underground Railroad was a great way to relocate the refugees, but it did have its flaws. It was still open to Combine interference. Eli and Isaac believed that there must be a better way to transport these people between bases. So, as scientists that have worked with teleportation technology, they began to build a teleporter in each of their respective bases, based on Black Mesa technology, where they plan to use a relay device on Zen to act as a slingshot between Dr. Kleiner's lab and Black Mesa East. The problem was actually getting the teleporters to work correctly. In Black Mesa East, Dr. Judith Mossman joined Eli's science team and added her expertise to help in the development of the teleporters. As Alex got older, she helped too and also travelled into City 17 to Dr. Kleiner's lab to check in on him and Barney. At one point, Judith and Wallace Breen made contact, where she became a spy for the Combine. Wallace discovered that although the Combine could jump from universe to universe, they had not yet discovered the technology that allowed them to jump from one point to another in a single universe, and this was the technology Black Mesa had looked into, and the technology that Isaac and Eli were working on right now. So, as a spy for the Combine, Judith took what she could from the Resistance's work on the teleporters and used it to help the Combine build their own in Nova Prospect. As a result of continued Resistance activity, the Combine discovered the Resistance town of Ravenholm. Having experimented on headcrabs as biological weapons, they launched headcrab shells into the old mining town, where an infestation began. The attack on Ravenholm meant that Black Mesa East had to make a difficult decision. Enter the town and take out the headcrabs to save their own, or seal the tunnels to keep a still secret Black Mesa East hidden from the Combine, so that they could continue their fight, where Eli decided to seal the tunnel, which left the resistance of Ravenholm on their own. Over time, Eli and Isaac continued their teleportation experiments, where at one point, they attempted to teleport a cat from Kleiner's lab to Black Mesa East. But this experiment did not go as expected. As a result, Barney would have nightmares about what happened to the cat for years. The resistance had come so far since the Seven Hour War, and it only continued to grow. An uprising was coming, all they needed was a spark. Approximately 20 years after the Combine invasion, Gordon awoke in a void, where the G-Man spoke to him. It appeared that the job he had been hired for was about to start. He was told to rise and shine from his rest, and that his hour had come. Then, the G-Man disappeared and Gordon found himself somehow on a train, entering a city. Confused, he left the train and saw the director of Black Mesa on a large television screen, welcoming the occupants of this train to City 17. To Gordon, the moments between entering the green portal after his battle with the Nylanth and his arrival on this train had felt like seconds, when in reality, it had been two decades. The G-Man had simply kept him in stasis and frozen his conscious thought. As he explored this train station, Gordon attempted to enter a gate to Nova Prospect, but the gate closed and stopped his entry. To his luck, Barney Calhoun happened to be working civil protection that day and recognised his old friend, where he took him to his office. A lot had changed in 20 years, and with Gordon still very confused, Barney began a video call with Dr. Kleiner, where they arranged to get Gordon to his lab. But when the civil protection officers became suspicious with what was taking so long in Barney's office, Gordon had to escape through a window, where he began his journey there alone, on foot. On his way there, Gordon did not speak to anyone in an attempt not to draw attention to himself, 
and headed through an apartment complex. Here, he saw just how terrified humanity were of the Combine and the civil protection. Unfortunately, Gordon did bring attention to himself, where the civil protection chased him through the apartment complex. To his luck, the civilians here guided him to the rooftop out of their reach, where he traversed the rooftops and avoided the bullets of the civil protection who fired from below. To escape the civil protection, Gordon entered an open window, but was ambushed by more of them, who beat him with their stun sticks. Unknown to them, Alex Vance had travelled from Dr. Kleiner's lab with the plan to retrieve Gordon, and she could fight, where she took out the civil protection unit with ease. After she introduced herself, Alex brought Gordon to Kleiner's lab, where these two old friends reacquainted. Gordon had last seen this man when he had been asked to reach the surface to get help. During this reunion, Barney joined them as Isaac gave Gordon an upgraded version of his HEV suit, and here, they thought about what would be best to do going forward. Gordon had arrived on a very important day. This was the day that Dr. Kleiner had finished the teleporter, and he believed it would work this time. So, after a conversation, Isaac called Eli in his lab, and together, they decided it would be best if Gordon was teleported to Black Mesa East, where he could put on his lab coat and work alongside them. Gordon wore the sign of the resistance on his chest once more, and as a man that had survived against the odds, his return meant a lot to the resistance and their cause, which pushed them much closer to an uprising. As Isaac prepared the teleporter, Alex was asked to go first, and after Gordon flipped the switch, she successfully teleported through to her father's lab. Next, it was Gordon's turn, but on his go, Dr. Kleiner's de-beaked head crap, Lamar, jumped into the teleporter as it charged up, where it malfunctioned. Over the next minute, the teleporter flung Gordon across the wasteland, and he saw just what the Combine had done to his planet. At one point, Gordon briefly found himself in the office of Wallace Breen at the top of the Citadel, who recognised him instantly. Breen was somewhat aware of the G-Man and his mysterious motives, and so, when Gordon disappeared, he contacted the Combine to let them know that something was off to which the Citadel was set to high alert and many units were sent out to track down and capture Gordon Freeman. Eventually, the teleportation sequence stabilised and Gordon found himself just outside of Dr. Kleiner's lab. Here, he once again had to begin a journey alone on foot, this time to Black Mesa East, and just before he embarked, Barney brought him a weapon he knew would come in handy on his journey, a crowbar. On his journey, Gordon took out many civil protection units as he ventured the Underground Railroad and the canals of City 17. Gordon left devastation in his wake as the Combine were never too far behind him, where they discovered each resistance base on this network, which led to the collapse of the Underground Railroad. Eventually, Gordon arrived at Black Mesa East and met Judith Mossman for the first time. She knew of Gordon and that he had taken her spot in Black Mesa, and here, they descended to Eli's lab. As Gordon and Eli reunited, Judith left to go into a back room and she alerted Wallace Breen that Gordon had arrived. Judith cared for Eli and the work they did together on teleportation, and as a result of these feelings, she asked Wallace not to attack until she gave the signal so that she could protect Eli. But Wallace's relationship with the Combine had strained due to Gordon's wake of destruction since his arrival. He needed some sort of action to let the Combine know that he was on top of this situation. So, against the wishes of Judith, he ordered a strike on Black Mesa East. After a heated discussion between Alex and Judith, 
Eli suggested that Alex take Gordon into the scrapyard full of technology that the Resistance had sourced from their raids of the wasteland and combine facilities. And here, Alex showed Gordon the gravity gun, a powerful piece of technology designed by Eli, which also held similarities to a project Aperture had developed decades before. Following this, Alex introduced Gordon to Dog, who, at this point, was much larger than she was. This had been the most peaceful moment since Gordon had arrived on the train to City 17, but it did not last for long. As Breen's forces arrived at Black Mesa East, Gordon, Alex and Dog re-entered the base to help Eli, but after a ceiling collapse separated Gordon and Alex, she asked Dog to take Gordon to the old Ravenholm tunnel where he could escape the raid, as she went on to attempt to help her dad. With trust in Alex, Gordon followed Dog and entered the eerie tunnel to Ravenholm, as Dog dropped the barricade and returned to help Alex. Gordon was alone again, as he followed the tunnel and entered this nightmare town. Gordon discovered just why Alex appeared to be afraid of this place. Ravenhelm was filled with zombies and headcrabs. These people had once fought for the resistance and in return had been left to die. On his way through this awful town, Gordon met Father Grigori, who, as a man of faith, guided Gordon past the dangers of Ravenhelm to an exit. Although Gregory had the option to leave with Gordon through the mines below the graveyard, he decided to stay. He believed his mission was to take out as many of these tortured souls as he could, so that they could finally rest in peace. After leaving the mines, Gordon continued on foot and arrived at Shorepoint Base, one of the many resistance bases across the wasteland. Here, he received a report from Alex who told him that Eli had been captured and taken to Nova Prospect. So, with a plan to save Eli, the leader of the Resistance, the Resistance members at Shorepoint gave Gordon a scout car to continue on his journey across the wasteland to rescue him. On his path, Gordon met the people who risk their lives every day to fight for the Resistance. He met Colonel Odessa Cubbage at New Little Odessa, where he helped protect it against a Combine gunship. He attempted to save Laszlo, the greatest mind of his generation, from Xenian antlions, but he was unsuccessful. And he met many Vortigaunts, one of which introduced him to Theropods. These allowed Gordon to manipulate pheromones, which, in turn, gave him the ability to weaponize antlions. And eventually, he arrived at Nova Prospect. Over in City 17, the pressure on Wallace Breen increased after every failed attempt to capture Gordon, where, in turn, Breen turned to his Breencasts to publicly ridicule the human arm of the Combine Empire for their failure to capture one person, a scientist. With the help of the Antlions, Gordon successfully broke into Nova Prospect and subsequently fought his way through the prison towards the depot. This was an addition that the Combine had built, and it appeared that they still had work to do on the rest of the prison. In this part, the Combine stored their prisoners and advanced technologies. In the wasteland, humanity feared this place as this was where stalkers were made, heavily mutated humans turned into biological husks. And this was also the place where the civil protection were biologically upgraded into Combine Elite soldiers. As he explored, Gordon reunited with Alex and together, they fought against the prison guards in their search for Eli. Battle after battle, the duo traveled deeper into the facility and with Alex's ability to hack into Combine computers, they stumbled upon a conversation between Wallace Breen and Judith Mossman. Judith appeared to be upset with Wallace that he had gone back on a promise not to touch Eli. 
to which Wallace responded that Eli was too tempting of a prize to simply turn loose, especially as Gordon Freeman had escaped. To Alex's surprise and anger, Judith argued that the Combine would have Freeman if Wallace had just waited for her signal. Wallace was under a lot of pressure from the Combine to stop this outlier, and although Judith stated Eli needed to come around to Breen's way of thinking without pressure, Wallace instead chalked this up to Judith having feelings for the resistance leader. As the call ended, Alex and Gordon headed further into the depot to confront the spy, where they eventually came face to face with Judith. In a fit of rage, Alex accused her of betraying the whole resistance as she brought out her father. Although Judith had been caught, she still denied the claim that she had betrayed the resistance, and instead had only worked to protect Eli. In the next room, Alex discovered the teleporter built from Eli's stolen work. With her main mission to rescue her father, Alex ordered Judith to prepare the teleporter as she contacted Isaac in his lab to get the coordinates on where to be sent. But Judith knew this equipment really well and distracted Alex with an error as she ran into the device, where she teleported herself and Eli to the Citadel. Having failed their goal, Alex and Gordon fought off Combine units as they waited for the device to recharge, and as the teleporter hit full power, Alex and Gordon jumped in and teleported. This teleporter in Nova Prospect was still in development and unstable, and having been used twice in such a short period of time, it malfunctioned and exploded. This explosion had two major effects. The first, that most of or all of Nova Prospect was destroyed as a result, and the fall of a major Combine stronghold had signaled to the Resistance that the Combine were not as indestructible as they had once thought, and if one stronghold could go down, then so could another. And the second, that Gordon and Alex had not arrived in Kleiner's lab as planned, and many believed them to have died in this explosion. Martyrs for their cause. Over the next week, an uprising began, where the resistance, led by Barney Calhoun, took to the streets to take back City 17. Block by block, the resistance liberated the streets, where the citizens joined them in their fight. Alongside this, the resistance also disabled the defenses that the Combine had put in place to keep out the hostile alien Zeni creatures from the wasteland, where headcrabs and antlions flooded the city. As Isaac packed up his lab in preparation to leave a war-torn City 17, he heard his teleporter activate in the back room, and as he opened the door with a shotgun in hand, he was surprised to discover Gordon and Alex. They were alive and Isaac had a theory on what had happened. As the teleporter was unstable when they used it, and the fact that the Combine did not use a Xenian relay as a slingshot for the teleportation, the duo had been stuck in a slow teleport that to them had appeared like seconds when in reality it had taken a week. After Isaac filled in the duo on what had occurred over the last week, Barney sent through a transmission and asked for help as he was under heavy fire. So, Gordon and Dog left to join the fight, as Alex stayed behind to help Dr. Kleiner out of City 17, which she did, and after doing so, she also joined the fight. On his path through a war-torn City 17, Gordon fought alongside the Resistance as a leader on his way to Barney, but Alex was captured by Combine forces during this push. Eventually, Gordon reached and rescued Barney from Combine snipers, and together, they led the Resistance to the Overwatch Nexus. Here, they not only took over this once feared building, but they also deactivated the suppression field that the Combine had used to stop the reproduction of humanity. 
As the resistance marched forward, they came upon the foot of the citadel, where Dog pulled up a part of a combine barricade to reveal a tunnel that led directly inside the citadel. Barney and his unit had control of this region. Now, it was up to Gordon to do his part. So, as Gordon dropped into the tunnel to rescue his friends, Barney shouted down a message to give to Wallace Breen. Tell him I said, Fuck you! Upon his arrival in the Citadel, Gordon entered a confiscation field which took away all of his weaponry, but it had a different effect on the gravity gun where it supercharged the device and turned it into a weapon itself. Here, Gordon fought past Overwatch Elite, but was ultimately captured and taken to Dr. Breen's office. In his office, Breen felt immense pressure. His control of the population of City 17 had gone, and he was desperate to regain it. He needed their submission so that his relationship with the Combine would continue. And so, with Eli in his grasp, he ordered the Resistance leader to tell them to back down. But Eli hated Wallace and the Combine agenda, and refused. As Gordon was pulled into the office, Wallace gloated that he had succeeded and once again demanded that the leaders of this resistance put a stop to the uprising. And once again, Eli refused and Gordon stayed silent, where, eventually, Breen brought out a trick up his sleeve. Alex. Although Eli loved his daughter, she too was as stubborn as he was, and together, the three resistance leaders refused to do anything Wallace ordered, to the point where Wallace threatened to send Eli and Alex to the Combine overworld as they were of no use to him. Silently, Judith contemplated her role in this whole situation. She had a strong relationship with Eli and had been promised that no harm would come to him but Wallace now appeared to be going back on it. As she decided her next move, Judith finally spoke up. She wanted Eli to be safe and argued that she needed him to complete their work on teleportation for the Combine, to which Wallace simply said that she was more than capable of finishing Eli's work herself. So, with Wallace having told her that Eli was set to suffer or die on the Combine overworld, she turned against him. Wallace asked Gordon to change the course of this uprising. He was the symbol and leader of this resistance, and as Wallace knew of the G-Man in some capacity, he spoke of how Gordon had essentially acted as a puppet for the G-Man and his employers. Before Gordon could say anything, Judith locked the doors of Wallace's office and freed Gordon from his containment pod. But unwilling to surrender himself, Wallace grabbed Gordon's gravity gun and activated it, where the blast stunned everyone in the room as he escaped on an elevator. As Gordon, Alex, Eli, and Judith recovered, Wallace contacted his Combine overlords and asked for help. Here, the advisor offered him a host body on their overworld. In this moment, Wallace Breen had a choice. Face the species he had betrayed, or become something new on a new world to survive. In desperation, Wallace chose the host body, but his call with the advisor was cut short as Alex and Gordon came for him. So, he fled again this time to a teleporter that could take him to the Combine overworld. Down below, Judith, repentant for her actions during this war, helped Eli leave the Citadel, where they planned to travel to White Forest in the Outlands, the place Arnie Magnuson had set up many years before in preparation for this very moment. At the top of the Citadel, Alex and Gordon discovered the dark fusion reactor that powered this entire structure, and with knowledge of how to use combine machinery, Alex waited in the control room as Gordon followed Wallace. As Wallace activated a portal to the combine overworld, 
Gordon fought against Overwatch soldiers as he climbed to the top of this structure to stop Breen's ascension. Using his wit and gravity gun, Gordon Freeman fights fears of dark energy at the reactor, where it was shut down. In this moment, a chain reaction occurred. The portal above the citadel closed, Wallace fell to his death, and all of the citadels across the planet were disabled. As a result of this, all access and communication to the Combine Overworld was cut off from Earth. In this victory, Alex cheered for joy, but then, the reactor exploded and a surge of energy came from it. As Gordon watched this burst of energy come towards himself and Alex, time stopped and the G-Man appeared once again. He told Gordon that he had done so much in his short time back. It appeared that Gordon had somehow done exactly what the G-Man had wanted him to do, and as he had completed his task, he was once again plucked out of reality. The G-Man explained that he was impressed by his work, and he had received tempting offers for his services. This time, the G-Man did not give Gordon the illusion of choice, and instead, placed him back in stasis, where he hoped to keep him for his next task. At the top of the citadel, with the G-Man and Gordon gone, time started again, but before the wave of energy could hit Alex, it was stopped again, this time by Vortigaunts under the influence of Antline Extract. This extract allowed them to amplify their abilities, and as some members of the Vortigaunt species had the power of foresight, they believed that they needed Alex for the fight to come. So, they too teleported into this region, grabbed Alex and placed her somewhere safe, away from the wave of energy at the top of the citadel. Alex found herself at the base of the citadel, pulled out of rubble by Dog, and out of harm's way. As she looked around, she noticed Gordon was missing. Over the next few days, Alex wandered the region around the base of the citadel with Dog as she searched for him, but he was not there. After their arrival in White Forest, Eli and Judith were reunited with Isaac and their old colleague Arnie Magnuson, where he caught them up to speed. Their rocket was almost complete and they believed that when the unstable citadel inevitably fell, then the Combine would find a way to come back to Earth and reclaim the planet. To stop this, Arnie needed just two things. The first, to complete the rocket, which would be done much faster now that he had Eli and Isaac, and the second, the coordinates to the Combine Overworld, which he believed were somewhere in the north. So, as Eli and Isaac got to work, Judith ventured to the north to discover them. With their enhanced abilities, the Vortigaunt broke into the G-Man Stasis prison, where he stored his recruits. They needed to find Gordon Freeman. The Vortigaunts had once only known Gordon as the man with a crowbar who came at them down the steel corridors of Black Mesa, but now he was the free man, the person that would save them from the Combine. Eventually, they found him, and he woke up. As they prepared to bring him back to Earth, they were interrupted by the G-Man, who had come to protect his charge. But as they had amplified their abilities, they were able to hold him off. This angered the G-Man as he appeared to have a plan for Gordon. However, the Vortigaunt were too powerful, so he left enraged with his plan for this scientist changed. In the north, Judith and her team discovered something unexpected, the Borealis. This ship had disappeared from Aperture decades before under mysterious circumstances. Although Aperture had attempted to keep their project secret, the personnel of Black Mesa had still managed to access confidential information. Since its disappearance, the Borealis had become a legend. No one knew how the ship had disappeared, there were only rumours that it involved teleportation. So, when Judith discovered it, 
she recorded some footage and returned to her Arctic base. Here, she documented her findings and began a transmission to White Forest, where she embedded her files into the transmission. The problem was that the Combine had spotted her team during their expedition, attacked her base and interrupted this transmission. Judith managed to flee this initial assault as the Combine took this transmission and uploaded it to their servers. On Earth, Gordon woke up and heard Alex's voice. The Vortigaunt had placed him somewhere that she would find him, and after Dog lifted up the debris on top of him, they were reunited. Over the last few days, the city had fallen even further as a result of the uprising and many had evacuated. As Gordon, Alex and Dog began their journey to leave, they heard Eli over a communication station. Alex had attempted to reach White Forest for hours, and they had finally initiated contact. Although Eli and Isaac were happy to hear that Alex had found Gordon and that he was still alive, they were upset to discover that she was still at the base of a highly unstable citadel. Isaac suggested that the only way they would be able to leave City 17 in time would be if they entered the citadel and stabilized the core. It would explode eventually, but this would give them and the remaining refugees in the city enough time to evacuate. With their mission clear, Alex and Gordon entered the structure and fought past the remaining Combine units inside. Gordon wore a HEV suit that protected him against the radiation of the core, and so it was his job to stabilize it as Alex watched from an observation window and looked through the Combine systems. With the core stable for now, it was clear that the Combine had set the core to melt down so that they could use the power from a dark energy flare to send off a data packet and request reinforcements from the Combine overworld. As Alex looked deeper into the Combine system, she also came across Judith's transmission with the embedded information that the Combine had stolen, in which Alex downloaded all of their data, Combine overworld coordinates included. Having done everything they could in the Citadel, Alex and Gordon boarded a Razor train out of the structure into City 17, and although this Razor train crashed, the duo made it to the tactical train station where Barney had charged himself with making sure that the remaining members of the resistance and refugees boarded a train out of the city. The problem was that the remaining combine units in the city also wanted to board the trains and kill the resistance. With the help of Alex and Gordon, the refugees made it to the train safely and having done his part, Barney decided to leave with them. As Barney boarded the train, Gordon and Alex said their goodbyes as he left. After this moment, it is unknown what happened to Barney. However, as he had shown similar survival qualities to Gordon, it is likely he got the refugees to safety. Gordon and Alex had done everything they could for the resistance in City 17, and it was their turn to leave but they were ambushed by desperate Combine units and a Strider, where Gordon had no trouble using a rocket launcher to destroy it as Alex prepared the train. As the train left the city, the core of the Citadel collapsed and a dark energy flare destroyed the dark tower and the city around it. From the train, Alex and Gordon watched as the Combine advisor pods launched out into the Outlands to safety. These creatures were the contacts Wallace Breen had with the Combine, and as far as he knew, they were the leaders. Although Alex and Gordon's train travelled at great speeds away from City 17, this burst of energy still caught up to them, and then everything went white. As Gordon woke up, he heard the strain of metal, and as he looked around, he saw that the train had just about survived the fall of the Citadel. Having survived another dangerous situation, Gordon made his way through the train to the ground where he was relieved to find Alex, also alive. 
Together, they started their journey towards White Forest. At one point, the duo looked out into the distance over the ruins of City 17, and right above it, they saw the formation of a super portal. This had now become a race against time, and they needed to get to White Forest with the data packet before this portal formed completely. However, the Combine knew Alex had this data packet and began their own offensive strike to stop the duo from reaching the Resistance base. On their journey, Alex and Gordon reached a communication station and contacted White Forest. Here, they let Eli and Isaac know they had survived the blast and that they had a data packet downloaded from the Citadel with all of the information the Resistance needed to move on with their plan with the rocket. Shortly after, the duo arrived at an old mine and as Gordon looked for a way to open a gate to get inside, Alex was violently attacked and impaled by a Combine Hunter as Gordon watched helplessly, trapped behind rubble. To their luck, they were close to a resistance base occupied mostly by Vortigaunt, Victory Mine. One of the Vortigaunts there detected that Alex was in trouble and came to save her, where it fought off the antlions around her unconscious body. The Vortigaunts knew just how important Alex and Gordon were in this fight against the Combine, and after the Vortigaunts freed Gordon from the rubble, it picked up Alex. Together, they travelled to Victory Mine. Alex was in a critical state, but the Vortigaunt explained that they could heal her. All they needed was for Gordon to retrieve Antline Extract so that they could amplify their abilities to save her. It just so happened that this base was situated on top of an antlion colony. And so, Gordon and the Vortigaunt that had saved Alex travelled into this colony to seek out the antlion extract. As Gordon and the Victory Mine Vortigaunt returned with the extract, the Vortigaunts here began their procedure on Alex. From a distance, the G-Man had watched the duo since they had both found themselves at the base of the Citadel, and with the Vortigaunts finally distracted, he froze time to have a heart to heart with Gordon. He told the scientist that he had plucked Alex out of Black Mesa when she was a child, as he believed she would also be a great investment, even if his employees had not initially seen her value. As a sort of repayment for saving Gordon's life after the death of the Nylanth, the G-Man asked Gordon to make sure that Alex arrived at White Forest safely. Then, before this mysterious entity said goodbye, he whispered a message for Alex to tell her father when she saw him next. Prepare for unforeseen consequences, a message only Eli would understand. Having said what he needed to say, the G-Man disappeared and allowed time to continue as normal. The Vortigaunts were completely unaware that the G-Man had taken advantage of this situation, but through power and concentration, they healed Alex's wound. With Alex healed, the duo left Victory Mine and continued on their journey to White Forest. On their path, they encountered a Combine advisor and discovered just how dangerous these creatures were. After they accidentally disturbed it, the advisor became hostile and showed off its telepathic and telekinetic abilities, where it lifted Alex, Gordon, and a dead resistance member off the ground as it prepared to strike them with its tongue. Fortunately, a piece of the machinery malfunctioned and injured the creature, where it flew off to safety. Eventually, Alex and Gordon reached a valley leading to the base, but came upon one final hurdle, a strider. This valley was fully occupied by the resistance, so when the strider prepared to attack, Dog jumped from a cliff and ripped out its brain. Following this, Gordon and Alex raced Dog through the valley to White Forest, where, depending on who tells this story, the answer on who won will always be different. 
The arrival of Gordon and Alex boosted the spirits of the resistance members of White Forest. Most importantly, Alex was reunited with her father, where he mentioned that as the Combine suppression field had gone down, maybe she and Gordon could give him some grandkids. Shortly after, the group got together and discussed the plan going forward. As they spoke, Lamar entered the rocket in secret. Gordon also placed a gnome inside of the rocket that he had picked up a while back. This was the final push for the resistance. They just needed to complete the rocket. This was also the first time Gordon had seen Arnie Magnuson since the Resonance Cascade. But Arnie remembered Gordon for a different reason. On the day of the Resonance Cascade, Arnie had prepared a casserole and placed it into the microwave in the kitchen. When he returned to collect it, he discovered the remnants of what his casserole had once been. Gordon was responsible for this. Arnie did not understand why Gordon had chosen to destroy his casserole that day, but he had held this grudge over all of these years. Now, Gordon was the symbol of their revolution. So, if this man could help them launch the rocket, then just maybe he could forgive him. For the first time in decades, the Combine forces stranded on Earth found themselves in a desperate situation. They had no contact with their overworld, and the Resistance had the ability to stop their reinforcements from coming through. They just had to stop the rockets from launching. Having fully prepared for this moment since they had arrived at White Forest, this base was prepared for any assault that the Combine threw at them in these desperate times. As an alarm went off, Arnie sent Gordon to deal with it as the other scientists continued their work. Here, Gordon, with the help of the other Resistance members, fought off a Combine strike. Safe for now, Gordon entered a control room and watched as Dr. Kleiner explored the information from the data packet Alex had stolen from the Combine, where they extracted the Combine Overworld coordinates, learned of Judith's attack, and her discovery of the Borealis. The discovery of this ship and attack on Judith instantly upset Eli. He argued that the potential technology on the Borealis, if used, could lead to another Black Mesa incident. He felt partially responsible for the Resnas Cascade, as he had not stopped the experiment when he had been told to prepare for unforeseen consequences. He did not stop that, but he could stop this where he argued that nobody should have that sort of power. On the other hand, Isaac argued that the technology on the ship could help the Resistance and their goal to remove the Combine from the planet. Following this heated discussion, Eli decided that he would go after Judith and save her himself, where he would destroy the Borealis too. But as a leader of the Resistance, Alex argued that if the Combine were to get their hands on him, they could use their advanced technology to acquire Resistance secrets from his brain. With all hands on deck, Dr. Magnuson called for Isaac to continue his work on the rocket, while Eli attempted to calm down. However, in this moment, Alex felt the urge to reiterate the words that the G-Man had said to her when she was unconscious. Prepare for unforeseen consequences. Eli knew exactly who Alex had heard these words from, and linked this warning to the new discovery of the Borealis. As Combine Striders entered the grounds and made their final push to destroy the rocket silo, Arnie introduced Gordon to a new weapon he had worked on, the Magnuson device, named after himself. This device was designed to be launched at Striders, and upon contact, stuck to them. These were also highly volatile, as one bullet destroyed everything in the range of the device. With his gravity gun in hand, 
Gordon left the hangar and, with the help of every Resistance member, they fought with and defeated this final assault on White Forest, as the scientists inside continued their work on the rocket. With word that the rocket had been completed during this battle and with the Striders dead, Gordon and Alex made their way to the rocket control room. Here, Alex, Isaac, Eli, Gordon and Arnie prepared to launch the rocket. In these last minutes, Isaac noticed an eight and a half pound anomaly in the rocket. Unknown to him, this was Lamar, but they decided that the rocket was still okay to launch, where Isaac volunteered Gordon to hit the button. As this scientist hit the button, the countdown began. This rocket, if successful, would change everything. The Resistance had all their hopes on this. So, as it launched, Alex, Eli and Gordon headed outside to get a better view of the impact, as Isaac and Arnie stayed inside to make sure that the resonator was activated when the rocket got close enough to the portal. On his way outside, Gordon was stopped by Eli. Eli told him that he was very proud of him and that he could not have been prouder even if he was his own son. He also mentioned to Gordon that he knew of who had told Alex about unforeseen consequences and they would have a conversation about this mysterious entity in the future. Following this heartwarming moment, Gordon and Eli joined Alex and Dog as the rocket hit the super portal, where it successfully stopped its formation and cut off the Combine's attempts to reconnect to their overworld. This was a great victory for the Resistance, but there was still work to do. Prepared to head off straight away to find Judith and the Borealis, they entered the hangar of an old helicopter Alex had fixed up that she and Gordon planned to use to travel, and Eli joined them. Just outside of the hangar, two Combine advisors waited for an opportunity to strike back at these key members of the Resistance, and as the trio travelled into the lower parts of the hangar, the advisors broke through the window in a last ditch attempt to stop them. Here, they used their telekinetic abilities and pinned Alex and Gordon to a wall, as Eli attempted to fight them off with a metal pipe. But the advisors were too powerful for him, where one lifted him up. In this moment, Eli told Alex that he loved her, as the advisor impaled the back of his head. He died upon impact. As the advisors prepared to take Alex next, Dog crashed through the ceiling and fought off these creatures, but the damage had already been done. Eli was dead, and as Gordon fell to the floor, he watched as Alex cried over her father's body. This is where Breen Grub and Epistle 3 take place, if you consider them canon. I have pinned the videos above and linked them in the description. The G-Man was disappointed with Gordon as a recruit, and as he watched from a distance, he had an idea on how he could hire Alex instead. He had a way to motivate her to accept his terms, he just needed to challenge her first. Using his abilities, the G-Man travelled back five years to where Alex was a young, impressionable 19-year-old. The Combine knew of the G-Man and his abilities, so when he appeared inside of an apartment complex in view of them, in this rare occasion, they brought him one of their most advanced pieces of technology, the Vault, to capture him. Here, he and the apartment building were trapped inside. This moment began the adjustment of the timeline. With this victory, the Combine kept the vault in a place above the quarantine zone of City 17 and reported the use of the vault on their internal network. On a raid of a Combine region, Eli Vance and another Resistance member, Russell, looked for equipment, supplies and information to help them with their cause. During this raid, 
Russell accessed a combine system and discovered information on something called the vault. But the information here was very limited on what this actually was. However, the access of this file alerted the Combine of their location, where, subsequently, Combine units were sent to capture them. This was the moment the G-Man had planned for. Eli was later captured by Combine units and Alex did what she could to rescue him, but ended up getting arrested herself. Luckily, Russell was able to break her out of Combine custody, where the two worked together to free Eli. Through her journey of the quarantine zone, a Xenian infested area of City 17, Alex used the Russells, also known as gravity gloves, and the weapon she came across to reach her father. Alex also met a Vortigaunt, Gary, who had suffered brain damage and somehow had a link to a big future event in Alex's life, Eli's death. But Alex thought nothing of this just yet, and eventually, she derailed a razor train and rescued her father. Free from combine capture, Eli and Russell looked further into the plans that they had stolen from the combine system on the vault where they theorized that it could be some sort of super weapon. Here, Eli sent Alex to investigate further as the words of Gary rang in her head, follow the Northern Star. As she evaded Combine forces, Alex looked out of a window and saw the vault for the first time, a giant floating ship in the middle of the quarantine zone, connected to several wires across the city. Alex later discovered a substation of the vault connected to an abandoned hotel. This hotel also happened to be called the Northern Star. So, following Gary's words, she entered the hotel, fought through the Xenian infestation within, and reached the substation. Here, she made a disturbing discovery. That this station was powered by a Vortigaunt trapped inside of it, where their natural Vortessence energy was absorbed and sent to the vault. On her path, Alex discovered more substations and rescued the Vortigaunt trapped within them. As she reached a zoo infested by antlions, Eli contacted Alex with more information about the vault. He and Russell believed it was not actually a super weapon, but a prison and whatever the Combine had trapped in there was very dangerous to their cause. As she continued on, Alex overheard a conversation between a Combine scientist and an advisor, where they discussed who was in the vault. Someone who had survived the Black Mesa incident and disappeared shortly after. Instantly, Eli and Russell believed this to be Gordon Freeman, the hero of Black Mesa, if they could rescue him, then this would be a huge win for the Resistance. So, Alex ventured on to attempt to do this. Eventually, all of the Vortigaunts in the substations were freed, which left the vault without power. However, a backup generator kicked in and kept the prison in the sky. In response to this, Alex made her way to the vault's dock and attempted to bring it in manually, but instead, the vault crashed into the ground. As Alex entered the vault, she fought her way to the core and discovered a man frozen in time, held by the Vortigaunt energy the Combine had stolen from its prisoners. Still under the impression that this was Gordon Freeman, Alex used her gravity gloves to manipulate the Vortessen's energy around her and shattered his cage. Here, the G-Man was free, and he was finally face to face with his potential new hire. She had passed his test, and he had an offer she could not refuse. The G-Man offered Alex a nudge as a reward for his freedom, in which she responded that she wanted the Combine to be removed from Earth, but that was too much of a nudge. He then played his hand and offered her something she did not yet know she wanted, and here, he showed her the death of her father. 
the G-Man let her know she could change this, and as she looked at her hands, they filled with Vortigaunt energy, where she struck out and sent a wave of energy through space and time at the Combine Advisor just before it killed her father. She had acted exactly how the G-Man believed she would, and had passed his test, just like Gordon and Adrian had back at Black Mesa. Here, he told Alex that he had another employee, but he was unwilling or unable to perform how he had expected, where the G-Man showed Gordon, who had disappointed him as a result of the Vortigaunt's interference and his actions. With Alex in his grasp, he took her from the moment just after her father had survived, and placed her in stasis as a new recruit. With his plan successful, he returned back to the present day and watched the aftermath of his actions, where Eli instantly knew that the G-Man had had a hand in his daughter's sudden disappearance. So, Eli Vance handed a crowbar to Gordon Freeman, where he said that they had work to do. After this point, the fate of Gordon, Eli, Dog, Isaac, Arnie, Judith, Lamar, the Gnome, the rest of the Resistance, the Combine, the G-Man and his employers, is unknown. Many years in the future, some believe this to have been 50 years, while others believe it was closer to 50,000. Deep underground in Upper Michigan, the Aperture Science Facility continued to function. The Combine still had not been able to access this facility, even in GLaDOS's absence, and as so, everything inside had continued to operate. Aperture planned ahead for the future and had installed an emergency test protocol that oversaw test chambers in a time of cataclysmic system failure, where the autonomous robots were able to function on a mere 1.1 volts. As time had passed, nature had reclaimed parts of the facility, and the enrichment center decayed without maintenance from Aperture personnel. However, some of these robots were sentient and sought to find out what planet Earth was like outside of the walls of Aperture, where a personality core, Wheatley, decided to enlist the help of the humans in the long-term relaxation vault. And here, he found one that was still alive, Chell. As she woke up, Chell was confused on how she had ended up here, the last thing she remembered was her fight with GLaDOS, and then a bright light. However, after Wheatley explained that some time had passed, and he knew of an escape route out of Aperture, Chell followed him. To escape the facility, Wheatley led Chell to the central AI chamber, where GLaDOS had once controlled and dominated Aperture. Here, they discovered her remains. It is unknown how her robotic body ended up back in Aperture, or how its design changed, but some theorize that the autonomous robots of the facility built her a new body in preparation to install her with a backup version. But no one came to do this, so her body, just like the rest of Aperture, was claimed by nature. Wheatley explained that all they needed to do was access the main breaker room to call an elevator to the surface, and they had to make sure that they did not accidentally activate GLaDOS in the process. As they entered the breaker room, Wheatley somehow managed to activate every switch, and as a result, he reactivated GLaDOS too. Since her death, GLaDOS's consciousness had replayed the last two minutes before her destruction on loop, constantly over all of these years as a result of a quicksave feature in her system. And the first thing she saw upon reactivation was Chell, the person that had murdered her. As a result of this, GLaDOS placed Chell back into a testing track and crushed Wheatley's core. Back in the same situation she had been in many years before, 
Chell worked through Aperture's test chambers as GLaDOS repaired the Aperture facility. Alongside this, GLaDOS also began development on two testing robots, Atlas and Peabody, where she planned to murder Chell when they were complete. However, Chell's incarceration did not last long, as Wheatley managed to salvage parts from spare cores in the facility to repair himself, and then he broke Chell out of the testing track. Within the maintenance areas, GLaDOS attempted to get back her rogue test subject, but Wheatley knew the maintenance areas extremely well, as he had worked here, and he had a plan to take down GLaDOS. First, he knew of GLaDOS's main forms of attack, turrets and neurotoxin. So, he led Chell to the turret manufacturing plant and instructed her to manipulate the production line. On this line, the completed turrets were scanned against a template to see if they were fit for use or defective. So, Chell adjusted this template and set the parameters to allow only the defective turrets to continue onto distribution, as the perfect working turret was sent to an incinerator. With GLaDOS's new turret now unusable, Wheatley led Chell to the neurotoxin chamber, where Chell used lasers to disable the robot's access to the substance. And here, with GLaDOS's defenses out of use, Chell returned to her central AI chamber. After a brief confrontation, GLaDOS realized what Chell and Wheatley had done, and are now defenseless against them. Chell initiated the core transfer process of the facility, where they swapped out GLaDOS's core with Wheatley's. This meant that Wheatley was now in charge of Aperture, where he called for an elevator so that he and Chell could leave. But this newfound power appeared to have a negative effect on him, and instead, he got mad and placed GLaDOS's core into a potato battery. In a growing rage, he accused Chell of bossing him around and working with GLaDOS, while Potato Battery GLaDOS realized that Wheatley was the core that had been attached to her and given her a constant stream of stupid thoughts. As he got angrier, he smashed at the elevator with a robotic arm, where it plummeted deep into the forgotten parts of Aperture. As Chell woke up, she saw a bird fly away with the potato battery GLaDOS, potatoes, and with her portal gun, Chell ventured into the enrichment spheres of Aperture to find her, where, upon discovery, she formed a more positive relationship as they attempted to climb up towards the surface. On this journey, the pre-recorded messages Cave had made were played out in two of the spheres, where Carolyn even made an appearance, in which GLaDOS recognized the voice as her own, a sort of conscience. And as time passed, GLaDOS appeared to unlock some semblance of the person she had once been before she was uploaded to a machine, and this appeared to soften her harsh personality. Eventually, Chell and GLaDOS arrived back at the Enrichment Center. At this point, they discovered Wheatley had an urge to test. This impulse was a side effect of being connected to the central AI system. If a test subject completed a chamber, then the robot was rewarded with a good feeling. But if they went too long without a test being completed, then they would get an itch to test. Wheatley had attempted to get around this with a new creation, the Franken turret, but they were unable to complete a test chamber. So, when Chell arrived back at the enrichment center, he put her back into a testing track. Since Wheatley had taken over the facility, he had neglected to care for it where its nuclear reactor began to melt down. As he did not know what the issue was or how to fix it, he just turned off the alarms and hoped the problem would go away. In this new era of Aperture, Wheatley renamed the facility to Wheatley Laboratories, and as Chell tested for him, he sought out other options to fulfill his testing needs. 
he knew how problematic Chell was. And then, he discovered Atlas and Peabody. With robots ready to take her place, Wheatley attempted to kill Chell, but as another person in this universe that had the extraordinary ability to survive impossible situations, she escaped and instead made her way to his lair. On her way there, Wheatley watched back the battle between Chell and GLaDOS, where he adjusted his lair to make it Chell-proof. However, Chell had a secret weapon, GLaDOS, where she suggested they attach corrupted cores to Wheatley's body to trigger a core transfer. As Wheatley gloated and threw bombs at Chell, she used these to break open a pipe of conversion gel, which, upon touching the floor tiles and walls, made these surfaces portalable. Here, GLaDOS brought in the corrupted cores as Chell placed them on Wheatley. After Chell managed to connect cores to Wheatley, the system detected that he was corrupted and a core transfer was triggered. Surprisingly, Wheatley had planned for this event and placed bombs around the button Chell needed to press to initiate the core transfer. And as she attempted to hit the switch, the bombs exploded and knocked her back. Dazed and confused, Chell looked around and saw just how close the Aperture Science Facility was to meltdown as a result of Wheatley's neglect and above, she saw the sky. Here, Chell fired a portal at the moon, which connected to her other portal beneath Wheatley. Instantly, Wheatley and Chell were pulled through the portal to the moon, and in this chaotic moment, GLaDOS was able to reattach herself to the central AI chamber and pull Chell back as Wheatley drifted off into space. With full control of her facility once again, and with two robots to test for her, GLaDOS allowed Chell to leave. It appeared that GLaDOS, in a way, cared about Chell as a result of Carolyn's influence. So, as Chell rode the elevator up, GLaDOS discovered the location of Carolyn in her files and claimed to delete her. Whether she did or not is unknown but she explained that Carolyn was her newfound conscience, and she did not want it. As Chell rode the elevator up to the surface, she was greeted by a turret orchestra, a grand send-off for her time in Aperture. And eventually, the elevator stopped and Chell stepped out into an endless field of grey. And behind her, a partially burned companion cube was thrown out, this was the cube Chell had been asked to incinerate way back in Test Chamber 17, but it appeared that GLaDOS had kept hold of it. Chell was finally free. The problem was that she had no idea what had happened to her planet in her absence as she ventured into the unknown with her companion cube. An untold number of years had passed during her long sleep in the extended relaxation vault, and it is unknown if the Resistance succeeded against the Combine, or if they still occupy the planet in some way. Regardless, the fate of Chell and her story is unknown after this point. Underground GLaDOS was free of Chell, and she now had her own robots to test for her. As Atlas and Peabody completed her newly constructed test chambers, she missed the fear that the human test subjects displayed. These robots could simply be put back together upon their demise, in comparison to the humans who would stay dead, and aware that some areas of Aperture were still out of her control. GLaDOS used her robot to acquire discs to access them in the hopes she could discover new human test subjects. After the retrieval and installation of these discs, GLaDOS discovered the human vault, the vault that the scientist had taken refuge inside during her assault on the facility. Here, she sent Atlas and Peabody to access it. Upon their arrival at the vault, these robots interacted with one another in what the scanner perceived to be human, 
and the door unlocked, where GLaDOS and the robots discovered thousands of human test subjects in stasis. With these, GLaDOS no longer needed Atlas and Peabody, so she set them to self-destruct and this time did not rebuild them. Over the next week, GLaDOS subjected her new human test subjects to her chambers. However, within just one week, she attempted to turn them into killing machines, but they all perished in her tests. Although GLaDOS preferred human test subjects due to their ability to display true fear and their limited mortality, when they did die, they were gone forever. And subsequently, as the final human test subject died, GLaDOS resorted back to Atlas and Peabody. In their reconfiguration chamber, Atlas and Peabody re-entered the testing hub. Here, GLaDOS told them that they had been out of commission for 100,000 years and the humans were still all fine, but she later confessed that the humans had only lasted a mere week. For GLaDOS to lie to her robots, it would suggest that she felt a sense of guilt that she had lied and for her failure to keep them alive. This further suggested that Carolyn may still have lingered somewhere in GLaDOS's memory banks. As she set her robots to test, GLaDOS detected something override her control of Aperture. To figure out what this was, she sent Atlas and Peabody to investigate. On their way, they used the skills they had learned throughout the test chambers and arrived at a control room outside of the standard testing region. As they entered, they discovered a bird's nest set up within an old chassis of GLaDOS. The bird had created a home here and laid eggs. Having formed a phobia of birds after she had been kidnapped by one, GLaDOS asked Atlas and Peabody to escape before it attacked them, but Atlas was brave and opened a hatch for it to fly away. And here, GLaDOS regained full control of her facility. Although the bird had fled, it had left eggs in the nest, in which GLaDOS took them for herself, with the plan to raise them as her own little killing machines. This is the last known moment in this long, complicated timeline. But in other universes, events occurred differently. The multiverse is an infinitely big place, and in other versions of Earth, Aperture acted differently. In one, Cave Johnson successfully transferred his consciousness into a machine, but due to complications, his fate left him trapped as a giant head without help. In another, Cave Johnson managed to trick the other Aperture Science facilities across the multiverse into building test chambers for him, where he was able to save enough money to keep his Aperture functioning the way he wanted. And in one more of an infinite number of possibilities, Cave Johnson became rich enough to purchase Black Mesa, and as the owner, he renamed the facility to Blaperture Mesa, and put a stop to the study of anomalous materials, completely aware of the possibility of a resonance cascade. In this universe, the people of Earth lived on, unaware of the existence of the Combine or their brutal reign, in the multiverse, anything is possible, too many to mention. But in our timeline, the population only suffered due to the decisions of a few. Here, our timeline ends, and now all we can do is wait for it to continue. I knew this video would be long, but I did not anticipate it would be this long. I guess covering more than 11 pieces of media in one video does that. I have done my best to piece this timeline together in the right order, but as we all know, Valve are pretty consistent when it comes to avoiding using dates, so after a ton of research, I believe this is the right order. It makes sense and events don't contradict each other. It was tough, but I'm happy with it. I have only used canon games in this timeline, so this is Valve's timeline of the events of Half-Life and Portal. 
I'm still surprised that some people did not know that Half-Life and Portal were connected, which is part of the reason why I made this video. Although Portal stories Mel, Entropy Zero, Entropy Zero 2 and even Hunt Down the Freeman add additional valuable lore to the world, they were not made by or commissioned by Valve. I did use Black Mesa to show the events of Half-Life but I made sure to use only canon friendly footage. Now, some of my older viewers will know that I created a Portal timeline and a Half-Life timeline a while ago. They were made when I was just starting out on YouTube and looking back, all I can see are the issues in the videos. The frame rate is off, the audio sometimes clips above my voice and the scripting isn't as strong as I believe it is now. Also, since then, Half-Life Alex was released and I didn't really give a lot of information about Blue Shift, Opposing Force or Decay. It also wasn't a combined timeline, they were separate. I really wanted to challenge myself with this and combine every story into one chronological timeline, which is why it's this long. I also want to give a huge thank you to Mr Floyd who went out of his way to get me access to maps from Half-Life Decay so that I could capture them on PC and in 4K. You all probably know who he is. He's recreating Half-Life Decay for PC as a solo experience, which he has called Half-Life Decay Solo Mission. I've linked the mod DB page down below for you guys to check out. There's even a demo out right now for it. He's a super nice guy and thank you again for your help. If you have made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I do appreciate it. I think that was everything I wanted to say. Please share it, please like it, subscribe if you are interested in deeper dives into specific topics, which I also cover on the channel. And finally, I would like to thank my gold tier patrons and channel members. Jonas, Lewis, Queen Arby, Fluffy the Dragon, Chicken Guy 791, Ruben Mendoza, Mosfalit, Montana Tusker, It's Sophie, and Laza Lowell. If you want to help support the channel, then there is a link in the description below to become a patron, where I do my best to post behind the scenes content, early access to videos, and many other great features. As always, thank you so much for the continued support. What did you think of this timeline? What is your favourite game in this series? And which game would you like me to cover in my next timeline? Let me know in the comments below. This is where our story ends. Check back next week for a new one.